we have some very exciting news. We've partnered with the National Trust for Scotland. Joining the Trust with one of their memberships helps to preserve and protect the many amazing, historical and significant sites across Scotland for future generations. Your membership gets you free access to all 500 National Trust locations across the country, as well as free parking. And who doesn't love free parking? A National Trust for Scotland membership is ideal for days out with the family or for saving money on that tour across Scotland that you're taking for your holidays to see all the generally spooky sites like Culloden Battlefield, Culloden Castle and Glencoe National Nature Reserve. Use the link in our description to get your Trust membership and you'll be preserving Scotland's history as well as supporting us here at the podcast. Thank you and happy travels! I have a very important question to ask you. Have you checked out the Generally Spooky Patreon yet? Because if not, why not? We've got oodles of content over there, exclusive episodes only available on Patreon, our wee blethers, the chatty, unscripted weekly show where Kieran and I discuss episodes, what's going on with us, and generally have a great time. There's also the Spooky Book Club, where you'll get a chapter a week of a spooky classic. At the moment, we're in the middle of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, and I am dying to know how it ends. As well as all that goodness, joining our Patreon is really what keeps the podcast going. It allows us to keep doing what we love, which is chatting to all of you about spooky Scottish history. You're £75 a month. No, I'm just kidding. You can pay £4, £8 or £12 a month to keep the lights on and keep the creepy cogs turning. So come join in. Search Generally Spooky Patreon or click on the link in our description. We recently partnered with The Spark Company here at the podcast, who are a clothing brand who know what's up. They're a community for anyone who believes in the radical notion that everyone should be treated equally. And we can definitely get behind that here at Generally Spooky HQ. And we know that you will too, since our listeners are the best. We've treated ourselves to some excellent pieces Kieran is already jealous of my fight like a girl sweatshirt, but he isn't getting it. And if you use our link to treat yourself to something just as awesome, it's yet another way to support us here on the podcast. The quality is great, the message is great, and if you use the discount code SPOOKYSPARK5 and the link below, you'll get 5% off your first order. Thank you so much, Spark Company. You guys are awesome. And thank you so much for supporting our rambling. Hello again. Hello, everybody. Did you hear those super professional podcaster ads at the start? Hopefully, hopefully, because, you know, if if you didn't, then we forgot to put them in. That would be, that'd be a shame, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, but something we would do, so yeah. let's not commit too hard to them being there. Yeah, look at us with our big boy podcasting trousers on. Well, I'm a big girl. Well, you can have your big girl pants Actually. on. Well, all right. We can have a big be whatever gender you want to be trousers on. It's just I want polka dots. It's harder to say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, exciting times. It is exciting times. If you're able to support us in any way, we really appreciate it. Yes, but even if it's just giving us a follow or telling your friends about us, that is a okay. It means a lot. It does. But you've heard all this, so we won't go into it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what do we do? The first episode of a season back is always a busy one because we always yes. have news. We're always excited and we have things to chat about oh, before we can get we, into it. We want to catch you up and everything. It's like coming back from a summer holiday. Yeah, just like... You have to tell your friends everything you were doing. So yeah. we have to tell you everything we were doing. So you're our friends. We don't have others. <laughs> I mean, I do. Ailey doesn't let me leave the house. I'm just chained <laughs> to my microphone. <laughs> chained to the dog. <laughs> that way neither of you gets lost. <laughs> That's a good system. It's the buddy system. Flawless. Flawless. They'll at least be together when we get lost. Yeah, unless one of you falls down a big hole and you're both fucked. Yeah, that wouldn't be so good. Well, I don't know. Should we just dive in? Well, I have some exciting information about oh. something I kind of want to do at Halloween. And I haven't given you any briefing on this before now. <laughs> do you want to talk about it? No. Please. On with the episode. It's so good. You're going to love it. And I want to tell everyone, because I feel like this is the perfect base for people who will also want to do this for Halloween. Okay, hit me. I can't remember if we talked about it in an episode. I feel like maybe we did. I don't know yet. I know. (laughs) I know. (laughs) 
rude. I feel like we maybe did in the Lark Hall episode or maybe the Boleskin episode. I can't remember. But have we talked about the program that the BBC did in the 80s, I think it was? I have it open in front of me. Called Ghost Watch. Is this the one that was like too spooky and they had to remove it from telly? Yes. We did talk about this because I've heard of it. But I can't remember when, right? No idea. Might It might have been the Lark Hall. Because I know the they, they film stuff for TV to do with Lark Hall and the, the Ghost Hunter, who we talked about in that episode, did stuff for TV. Yes. So I feel like it was in that episode yeah. back in season one. For the people who don't know. Ghost Watch was one of the best things to ever appear on television. I th- oh, it was 92, not the 80s. It was broadcast on Halloween 1992. And it's what they've dubbed since a uh, mockumentary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was a fake documentary they did all about this haunted house. Mm-hmm. And like, Michael Parkinson was in it. Amazing. He was the presenter of this show that didn't really exist called Ghost Watch. That'll mean more if you're British. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even think of that because he's just such a household name. I didn't yeah. even consider Party. people might not know who he is so you know he he was a presenter who did lots of interviews he's very famous so him being the presenter of this fake show gave it more weight yes and it was all about this team who went into this haunted house to investigate the haunting and all this stuff was happening in the house it was really scary and then stuff started happening in the tv studio where they were filming live <laughs> And it was, people lost their minds. They thought it was really, really scary. They're releasing the Blu-ray this Halloween. Oh, well, obviously we're going to watch that. So I thought we could do that kind of to celebrate the season ending. Yeah. Because the season ends on the 28th of October, my birthday. And then Halloween is a couple days after. So I thought we could try and buy it. Because I think you can pre-order. Yeah. Because it's the 30th anniversary this year. Oh. So they're releasing it. They released the DVD for the 10th anniversary. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Now it's released on Halloween in the UK, and I think it's October 25th in the US, from oh, what cool. I can see. So if you're in the US and you're interested, it is going to be available. Ooh. But I reckon you could maybe get it digitally or whatever. That would be fun. So I wondered about watching that. We, yeah, we should absolutely do that. For Halloween. Uh, it sounds like a paranormal activity, but before in you know, the movies. Yeah, yeah, it's very that. The parano- paranormal activity movies. Yes. It's just, it's kind of, it's kind of found footagey, but kind of modern ghost hunting show. But the 90s BBC. But fiction. Sounds superb. It's It's been really controversial because it had such yeah. an impact at the time. It it, just, I, I love everything about it. I've never watched the full no. show. I would really like to do it. I bet it's well shit, and I'm down for it. <laughs> shit, I think it's going to be amazing. Well, I think it'll be amazing, but because it, it'll be really bad, you know. I'm excited. I'm excited. Well, that's fun. And when I found out about that, I was looking into it, and the last, le- you know the last leg, the show? Yep. If, again, if in the UK, you'll know this. It's a comedy, like, panel show. Very, very funny. Uh, they were talking about Ghost Watch last year Mm -hmm. I think and I didn't realise but they were talking about the show and they were kind of taking the piss and they did like a fake seance like there is in the Ghost Watch show and then either the producers have set it up or it genuinely happens one of the lights explodes (laughs) which is what happens in Ghost Watch (laughs) in the studio and it happens on the last leg and they just they don't know what to do you can tell none of them expected it because the presenters are just shitting themselves. <laughs> I see if I can. I've got the clip here. If I can share it and post it, I will. But if not, uh, I think the video here on YouTube is called "Is the Last Leg Studio Haunted?" Nice. And the light explodes. I just thought it would be fun, so yeah. I wanted to talk about it and tell you if you're listening because you might be interested. Yes. In doing this with me would be super fun. Ooh, exciting! Yeah. Well, that is a fun bit of news. Right? But that's all the news I have. <laughs> Sounds fine to me. I have no news. I'm newsless. Just a nuisance. <laughs> You're not wrong. So yes, we have two months, people, to get ready to watch Ghost Watch en masse. I'm down for that. 
Well, shall we roll some music and dive into today's episode? Yeah, I'm pumped. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So I believe we have a bit of a longie today. We do. I have 34 pages of script. That's quite long. Yeah. Well, are we Are we like one in already, if, you, if your intro was written down? We're still on page one. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't write about Ghostwatch in the script. I found it after. Oh, nice, nice. That was just something that I had to share because I'm so excited about it. Yeah, that was pure passion, yes. people. <laughs> I am here. <laughs> <laughs> So no, I've made it even longer. <laughs> well, good. Well, what do we have today? Well, last week we kind of got back to our roots with just a good ghost story, I feel like. Yep, I we enjoyed it. talked about the Socky Poltergeist. Uh-huh. If you haven't listened, it's very interesting. It's really intriguing. Rather spooky. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like even the people who don't really like the ghosty episodes will find something they enjoy in that one. Who doesn't like the ghosty episodes? I don't know. Who are who are you people? Show yourselves. <laughs> but that episode was set in the 60s. Yes. And I feel like today with this episode, we're getting back to like the other pillar of the podcast. Mm. Because we are venturing way back into Scottish history. And we are talking about a haunted castle. Woohoo! I like the castle episodes. They they seem quite popular. Yeah. You guys seem to enjoy them. You like hearing about a spooky castle and all of the history. Like, who doesn't? Connected to it. And for this one, we are venturing into what is basically our back garden. Yes. Because this week, we are talking about Codder Castle. Oh, yes. Now, I knew this. <laughs> oh, yep. my God. He renew what we're talking about this week because... We visited before. I had you. I set you up at home with asking what this week's episode is. Ha ha. Practical joker you. <laughs> you just got japed. Maybe not japed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe anything else but that. Yes, we visited at the weekend past. We did. We've visited before. We did. We took your granny. It was very nice. We did. We took granny around the gardens and took her for lunch and she had a great time. But this time we went solo. Uh, mainly because there's quite a lot of stairs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she was fine the first time, but she's, you know, I don't want to put her through that again. No, I think once was plenty. Mm-hmm. I think if I take her again, we'll maybe just stick to the garden. Mm-hmm. Although, shout out to Cotter Castle, because when we took Granny, um, there's one part where you have to go up quite steep stairs, and then you come down some really steep stone stairs. Yeah, a big, like, classic spiral staircase. Which she just would not have managed. No. Uh, and the, the, the guy... The guide who was there, he let Granny go down like the main staircase that's usually shut to the public, which was so nice. He did, he did, and she didn't even fall down it. Nope. Thank God. Thank goodness. That's the stairs that has all the muskets on the wall, so that could have been dramatic. <laughs> a I mean, grand it's, end. it's fitting with who she is as a person. I'm not gonna lie. But, yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yes, we went together. So I have read some of the plaques. Yes. But I don't. I haven't looked into the history necessarily oh i took some notes Ooh. which i should find on my phone well, you've been prepared while we were there well it was really nice getting to visit we wanted to have a more up-to-date idea of what's at the castle and what it's like to be there uh, they do lots of stuff if you go the cafe is really nice it's a nice cafe it's really nice they also do open air theater every summer also and very we fun. finally went this year we went to go see jane eyre and they often have performances of macbeth for reasons I'll get into later. Mm. Do you have anything else you want to add before I jump in? No, I don't think so. I'm just checking my notes again. Yeah. Because I was going to look at them before now so I could prepare beforehand. And I didn't. And now we're recording. So we're going with it. Just by the seat of your pants, babe. As always. That's what you do every week. Yes. And I, it's working for you. I will say, I checked the windows for ghosts and there weren't any. You did. You were very thorough. Uh, I was a brave boy looking for the ghosts. <laughs> But I didn't see any. Is it brave to look for things that you don't think exist and that don't scare you? Mm, maybe. I don't think so. 
something like a little bit? I don't think so. No, probably not. Well, dive in. Okie doke. How far back are we going? Almost a thousand years. That's a long way back. <laughs> because Cotter's story seems to start with King William the Lion back in the 1100s. Very good name. I like Isn't it. Isn't that a brilliant name for a king? Mm-hmm. And I didn't really know much about him specifically before my research for this episode. Um, but he's the one who started using the red lion rampant on a yellow background. Oh, well. The flag. Yeah. That I'm sure everyone has seen. If you know anything about Scotland, you have the saltire, which is the blue and white mm-hmm. cross. And you have the lion. He started using that. That's that's a claim to fame. Yeah. I like that. I, mean, I like he, that. He was already king. That's pretty... Well... <laughs> Yeah, but you can. As far name, as fame goes, that's kind of up there. You can you can name most of the kings. I mean, they're all like William, John. Well, Robert, first name Malcolm, <laughs> Duncan, James. That, like ten Jameses, you're set. Yeah, that probably covers most of them, to be fair. But still, you know, that's they're pretty cool. That's a legacy. That's why I included it. But he features in our story because he was the one responsible for first building what could be termed as Codder Castle. It was a different structure to the castle that's there now, which is common, Mm -hmm. that places move from site to site. Um, They're just quite close together. So the one that King William had built doesn't exist anymore, but he did have a fortified building in the area around Codder. And he was an interesting figure in the history of Scotland. He was the longest reigning Scottish monarch before 1603, his butt was on the throne from 1165 to 1214. So he reigned for 49 years. That's pretty good going. And remember, this is a long time ago, so times are turbulent. That's like four generations right there. Yeah, like a monarch (laughs) generally had a short shelf life because, you know, death. Yeah. So an almost 50-year reign is impressive. That is pretty good going. And he was made king after his older brother died. Oh, okay. And William, by all accounts, he was very tall large, strong, with red hair. So almost everything you would expect from a Scottish king. Yep, that's pretty much the peak. And he invented the new flag. I don't know if he invented it or if he was sort of... He made it cool. (laughs) Trendsetter. (laughs) Yeah. He also founded Arbroath Abbey, which is a very important site. That's where the Declaration of Arbroath was signed. I'd be damned. (laughs) Well, that was a reach. Yeah. Do you remember the Declaration of Arbroath? I do. I do. It's the one everybody signed for some reason. So, no, you don't. That was a lie you just told. (laughs) I mean, I I remember it's come up a lot. Oh, that's good. Good day. (laughs) The Declaration of Arbroath was the document stating Scotland's independence from England. And it was signed by lots of Scottish nobles and sent to the Pope. Yes. And it's come up four or five times, and I never remember what it is. Several times, yes. We've even, I think we've seen it. I think it might be at the National Museum. It is, and we have. Yes, because I remember the big mural on the wall. Mm-hmm. So you've seen it in person. Yep, the writing's on the wall. Now, it was William who kind of shifted Scottish society into a feudal system. Oh, okay. That looked more like what was happening in England at this time, so... With feudal feudal systems, you're looking at like barons who mm-hmm. own lots of land, and then you have people who work the land, yes, and who rent from the lord, yes. It's very poorly explained, but if you think of like classic Middle Ages or like medieval times, yep, that's the feudal system where you have your king and then your lords and earls under the king, and it all trickles down that way. Yeah, a very clear hierarchy. There's a reason that William wanted to shift to this kind of feudal system because it's great for kings and and queens, but we're talking about kings just now because it solidifies their authority because they have control of the earls and the barons and what have you, the dukes, viscount, whatever the fuck. They have control of them and they want to keep their power so they keep the king happy, but they're quite happy having people under them Yes. To control. And then that's just the way of things, and the king is always the top dog. He's the top dog with all the money, and that's why we had the Dark Ages for 500 years. Kind of like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> yeah. It's pyramid in structure. Yep. Py- py- pyramidal? Is that a word? Pyramidic? I don't know. 
I'm not a scientist. I don't know. The original MLM. <laughs> monarchy. The multi MLM. <laughs> the multi level monarchy scheme. <laughs> I think the thing with MLMs is they're always adamant that they're not pyramid schemes and that's why they don't get shut down. Mm. Even though they totally are. They definitely are. Anyway. The reason William did it, it solidified his authority, which he really needed because he didn't have a lot of control in the north before this. Yes. Because we've talked before that Caithness and the north of Scotland had always been more independent. Yep. And from what I can see, this is one of the reasons that William had a castle built around Cotter. Just to keep things in check. Yeah, to kind of bring people to heel a bit more and just he wanted to be king in the north. Yep. Which he wasn't treated as such before. Yes. That makes sense. That makes sense. And the reason for the site that he had for the castle, which I couldn't exactly find. I think there might be ruins or like remains, but there's no evidence of the building properly. Where he had his one. Yeah. Yep. Um, the reason that he built it where he did was because he wanted to control the River Nairn, which was important because it led to the sea. Oh, I wouldn't have thought. Oh, I was good for trade. Well, because it's not very deep. I would have thought to like transport up and down it. It's not very deep now. I guess so. It could have been deeper. It's a thousand years ago. It is a thousand years ago. There's a good chance it would. It was different. Fair play. Fair play. He, <laughs> King William was the one who appointed the first thane of Cotter. Which is a title you might have heard of before. Yes. And this Thane of Cawdor was also the sheriff and hereditary constable of the royal castle at Nairn. That's a title. I so, know there was a castle at Nairn. It's, well, it's this castle that... Oh, I see, yep. Um, so King William wasn't living here permanently, but he had the castle built and then he appointed someone to look after the land. Gotcha. Which I- is where this title has come from. I've always wondered what a thane does. How you thane, become a thane. It's... Pardon me. It's kind of equivalent to like an earl, I think, or a baron. Oh. In... Or is it a... I can't remember. It's a really important title. Yeah. And it's... In some cases, you have the king and the thane is immediately under the king. Okay, damn. So like, very important in terms of rank. Yes. Is the king allowed to have multiple thanes? Yes, of different areas. Yeah. In the same way you might have multiple earls. Well, that makes sense, yeah. Of different areas. Interesting. So he's not like a right-hand man. There's not just one of them. Yeah. You have a thane of different areas. Gotcha, gotcha. I see, I see, I'm with you. The area manager. <laughs> yes, the boss babe. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, William was somewhat obsessed with bringing Northumberland into his control. He wanted it to be part of Scotland instead of England. It's in the northern part of England. Yep. Which you probably could have guessed. Uh, And when King Henry II's sons and wife rebelled against him down in England, they tried to overthrow him. William threw his lot in with them because they promised him Northumberland. Oh, I think this might have come up before. Possibly. Rings a bell. But yep. he went against the English king Ooh. to try and win. What are these power-hungry kings? I know. It didn't end well, because King William was captured. Ooh. And the condition of his release was that he had to recognise King Henry II as his overlord. Ah, that's... Thus effectively handing Scotland over to Henry. Ooh, swing and a miss. Yeah. Swing and a miss. Yeah. And eventually it was <clears throat> it was King Richard I who sold Scotland back to William because oh. he needed money to fund his crusades to the uh, Holy Land. That makes sense. I wonder how much he sold it for. How much is all of Scotland worth? I can't worth? even remember. I think I might have seen it. It was in Mercs. Oh, yeah. But I can't remember. Because <laughs> this is already a long tangent. Yeah, it's just... I just thought it was interesting. It is interesting. So, okay, like, we captured you. This is ours. We'll sell it back to you, however. Um, okay, I'll just put everybody's taxes up. Sweet. Yeah, it was basically sort of part of the system because Henry had been the overlord. I think they were basically selling the title of king back to William. Yeah. 
Which is strange. It's strange, isn't it? But we're jumping to the 1300s now. Whoop. We're leaving King William the Lion in the 1100s. Oh, bend those knees on landing, everybody. Yep. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself on impact. Stretch. It's important. Yep. Stop sitting like a shrimp. Land on the balls of your feet. Because I know if you're sitting listening to this the way that I sit and listen to things, you're sitting like a shrimp. Yeah. Straighten that back. Roll that shoulder. Ooh. Do it. 1300s. Yes. The only thing I could find on the very first Thane of Cotter, which is a pretty famous title, um, I'll get into it later, but his name was Donald. And really, the only thing that we know about him is that he signed a document in 1295. <laughs> But it shows that he existed. Yep. But there's not really anything else to say about him. Yeah. That's so weird, isn't it? That's all it takes to to be recognised through history. Yeah, you, have, were, you were there. You signed. Have your name on a piece of paperwork that doesn't get stolen or burnt or washed away. I've been thinking lately, because I don't want to sound big-headed or anything, but the podcast is getting quite quite a lot of listens. More of you are finding your way here, and it's lovely. But I'm mean, thinking about how, like, this is a record of our existence. That's true. Because we're recording ourselves as we are now. Yeah. And who knows how long this will be up. That Apologies is the- for that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening 50 years from now, say hello to the overlords. Yeah, like, blink your comment. Please tell Skynet we were sorry or <laughs> something. <laughs> this is why Skynet was able to take over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is a smidge more interesting than the first because he was granted his title and the right to it, the right to give it to his sons to pass it on uh, by Robert the Bruce himself. That's pretty cool. And what I didn't know, which I thought was interesting, is that the Thane, the second Thane was called William, he had to pay for the privilege of his title. Oh, yeah? He had to pay a yearly fee to be the Thane. Hmm. And I didn't think that would happen. I thought your title was yours. Yeah. But he had to pay King Robert a yearly fee to be the Thane. Wow. Like a really old version of a subscription service. Yeah. It doesn't entirely surprise me. But it is new information. But you know, it seems like separate to being taxed. Yeah. When well, when you can sell the king back his kingship. Yeah, I suppose you can sell anything really if yeah. someone wants it. But he was granted his title by Robert the Bruce in 1310. Very nice. Do you think he paid it and went, ah, oh, it ain't nothing but a thing. <laughs> You're on a roll today, Thank boy. You. Thank you. I'm in a good mood. It's the Pepsi Max. <laughs> <laughs> Small caffeinated fizzy beverage. <laughs> Now, at this time, the castle as we know it still didn't exist. The family, uh, the Calder family, not Calder, Calder, C-A-L-D-E-R, had a different castle at a place called Old Calder, which is about a mile away from where Calder Castle is now. That is a better place to seek the Calder family. Yes. In Calder. Yes. I like it. But Calder Castle as we know it was built around 1380. Oh, well. And it was originally commissioned by the third Thane. Okay, so okay. I'm going to try and keep you right with which Thane is which, because yep. it's tricky. It's the same as the House of Dunn and the Colleen Castle episodes. You know, where there's just loads of them. Yes. I remember we had to talk about all the Erskins. So many Erskins. This is a similar thing. Yes. So it took me so long to put this together, because I just kept getting lost. <laughs> but yeah, it seems like it was Thane number three who had the castle built. That's very cool. I wrote down something. See, that's the thing with the notes I've taken. I don't know if you're going to get to them. Mm. So I don't want to jump your point. But did the castle get settled where a donkey lay down? We are going to talk about that towards the end of the episode. Never mind. (laughs) (laughs) Then we shall get to that. We will get to it. Hold on to your asses. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I get it. I can't help myself. It's like a condition. Yeah, please, please sponsor a a poor Kieran today. (laughs) With your help, we can sedate him so he doesn't hurt himself or others. Get him a big bed we can belt him to. (laughs) We can strap him to the dog and they can both run away together. (laughs) Now, it's 1454. And... 
a document is drawn up at this time which grants William Calder, so the name is Calder at this time. Mm-hmm. The name Calder didn't come up until like the 1800s. Yep. It had always been Calder before then. William Calder, the sixth thane, was given the right by the king to fortify his castle. Oh, yes. So yep. he had to apply for permission to do this mm-hmm. from the king. Uh, and on our visit to Calder that we took just a few days ago, there's an artifact there from the 1400s oh, yeah. that we saw. And I'm wondering if you can remember or guess what I'm talking about. Um, I need like 20 questions to narrow it down. <laughs> Is it inside the castle? Yes. Um, I have no idea. No idea at all. Oh, is it the speech that's on the tapestry? No, but that's a good guess. I'll keep guessing. I'll be here all night. It is the Iron Yet, which is an iron gate that's at the entrance to the dungeon room of the castle now. It's a big black iron oh. great gate. This was actually taken from another castle nearby. Oh, yeah? It was taken from a place called Lock and Dorb Castle. Oh, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> the Thane of Cawder... Was Or actually, before I even get to that, there's a couple of different versions. Some people say that it's the gate at the entrance to the castle at the drawbridge. Yeah. Is the one that's taken from Lock and Dorb. Other reports, including the castle itself, the guidebook, say that it's the gate that leads into the dungeon room. That seems more likely, because it was inside, it would last longer. Yeah. So, it, I don't know. I've, I've read both. I think it's the dungeon one, because that's what Cotter Castle have said. It's cooler, too. But the Thane of Cawdor was ordered to take this yet from Lock and Dorb Castle by King James II. It was a very important job. He yeah. had to take it as they were dismantling this castle. Pretty cool. But you aren't going to find out more about that until later in the season. In the season? Mm-hmm. Ooh. Oh, stay tuned. <laughs> or scroll down if it's already released. True. <laughs> I thought I'd give you a little teaser there. I like that. I initially thought it strange that you had to apply for permission to fortify your castle, but I suppose it makes sense, because it could be an act of war. Well, yeah, if you're getting ready to attack the king, to make yourself king, that would be an issue. Yeah, so... Yeah, you had to apply for permission. That makes sense. Which he was given. And they got it? Yes. Now we're going to talk about William the Seventh Thane. Powering along? I like it. I'm trying to power along, but... I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to get through. William the Seventh Thane was an interesting character. He married very well a woman called Margaret Sutherland, uh, and she was from a very well connected family over like, towards Dornick and places, I think. Very nice. I have to assume Thanes three, four, and five weren't very interesting characters. <laughs> no, there's not a lot about them really. Um, like, there's various kind of political bits and but I'm trying to just ah. stick to the the fun parts otherwise we could be here for days. Yes. Being go to the castle for all the information. You, you can. Want. I bought uh the brochure, the guidebook and there's quite a lot in there. Yep. So <laughs> feel free. But he married Margaret Sutherland and she was she was part of a very well connected family. So her family were very wealthy, but through marriage her family were connected to other powerful families. And I read that this gave William kind of the feeling of being invincible because he had lots of power on his own and his marriage had given him even more because over this time with the third, fourth, fifth thing behind him, they had also made good marriages so it strengthens the family to have all these connections. I see, but you do that over like 20 generations and that's why things get a bit incesty. Yes, (laughs) yes. But you get what I'm saying? Yes. You make allies through marriage. William didn't really get on with one of his neighbours. Which, you know, it would be a fairly normal thing. Not everyone gets on with their neighbours. But the problem with William's feud is that it was with the Baron of Kilrock. Ooh. I'm going to check my pronunciation. Kilrock. It's a bit spicier for you. Yeah, I said it right. Oh, is it right? Mm. Kilrock. But it's spelt K-I-L-R-A-V-O-C-K. Hmm. Now, Kieran, you will have seen road signs for Kilrock Castle. 
I have indeed. We've driven past them because it's not far from here. I thought it said Kilverock, though, but... Yes, but that's why I checked the... the it's pronounced Kilrock. Uh, and William's feud was with a man called Hugh Rose, who was the Baron of Kilrock. Very nice. Which I think I just said, I'm not sure. Yes. Really, being you can't swing a cat without hitting a castle, where we are right There now. are a lot of castles around here, in various states of mm-hmm. disrepair. And the two men were at odds with each other, and William, the Thane of Calder... We'll say Calder just now. Actually imprisoned Hugh's son for a time. Mm, bold. Mm-hmm. His eldest son. Ooh, he can't be doing that. And everyone knows that an eldest son is a baron's most valuable asset. Yep, obviously. Now, in the end, the whole thing was only resolved because William was ordered to release Hugh's son. And it's unclear what he imprisoned him for. He was issued with a royal warrant, William was, that demanded he release the boy. Go on, give him back. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to hear it. Give him back. It's his son. So, you know, that's that's some bad feeling between neighbours. Yeah, that's not great. And this wasn't even the only time that William was in trouble. Oh, no. It's not even the worst thing he ever did. Oh, no. In 1492. Yep. King James IV was in Inverness. Oh. Which is a strange thought. It is a strange thought, isn't it? Now, he's the King James who married Margaret Tudor, who was Henry VIII's older sister. Yes. And this is the the seed that made it possible for James VI to become King of England. Yep, Ailey's favourite person. He Ugh. comes up a lot. Ugh. But do you see? I'm with you. It's all coming Because this King together. James is his grandfather. Yes. And this is the King James who died at the Battle of Flodden. Yes. Now, I didn't know this, but... When they found his body on the battlefield uh-huh. at Flodden, he had been hit and shot with an arrow in his lower jaw. Oh. And that didn't kill him. Oh. Someone literally shot him in the face. That knocked him off his feet and then they just had at him. Oh. That's a, that's a bit of a way to go, isn't Can it? you believe that? Yeah. Oh, I, I had to tell you because I was just like, what? But that's not really important. In our story, James IV is still alive and in Inverness. He hasn't died yet. Uh, he's in Inverness to hold court as a judge. Mm. And William is the one being tried and sentenced. Ooh, what for? The seventh thane of Codder, our William. Our Bill. His son. So the eighth thane. Yep. And five other men were all on trial for murder. Mm. They were tried for killing several men. What did they do? Because you don't seem very surprised. I thought this was going to be like... What? <laughs> I mean, I'm more surprised that they're being tried. Okay, um, it's no. just Fair. Rich people killing people and everyone going, oh, man. And then life moves if on. If only we could have stopped it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were on trial for killing Patrick Wiseman, Duncan McAngus, William Blacklaw and John Reed. I think Duncan McAngus is the most Scottish name I've ever well, heard. Well, the way it's written down is M, comma, Angus, but I can't say Mangus. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming it's McAngus. <laughs> you have to assume so. <laughs> In the documents that have survived from the time and from this trial, the wording is that they were actually charged with slaughter. Ooh. And I was going to say... I even have this in my notes that initially I was going to write that, you know, it's not very becoming of a thing to be accused of slaughtering people. But as we've discussed here at length, people with castles often behave badly. Yeah. So you're probably right to not be surprised at this point. We're yeah. in our fourth season. It's almost like owning a castle doesn't make you a good person. Right? Isn't it weird? That's weird, that is. It seemed that the men who were murdered were murdered in revenge for stealing the thane's cattle. I was wondering if there'd be sheep rustling or some such involved. Yeah, that was the reason. Mm. Stealing cattle. So they stole cattle and then got murdered for it. Yeah, because that's fair. I mean, I assume they're probably going to get off with it, so it probably will be decided it's fair. To be fair, in certainly in England, I think they were over... I don't know if it's the same for Scotland. I'm not trying to just have a dig. <laughs> I just don't know the facts for Scotland. But I think in England, there were over 200 offences that you could be executed for yeah that yeah, there were so. a lot and that they were, would be hanged for really quite minor things I, I would say there was a lot of very minor things weren't there mm-hmm. 
But I'm only saying England specific because I don't know if Scottish law was the same. I assume it was the same. But as you expected, on every count, the Thane was pardoned by the king himself. (laughs) Oh, I have it. Here we go. I've answered my own question from earlier. Being a Thane is kind of on par with being a baron. Okay. So I did write it down just later. Couldn't recall it to head. So yeah, you're in the service of the king. It's going to look pretty bad if the king sentences you to death. Yeah, and he'll be there going like, ah, if I kill you and your sons, who's going to pay me? Well, it was his one son. Oh, one of his sons. Yes. Even still. like Even uh, so, yeah, it's going to cause problems. And then you'll have a lot of other sons and daughters who are probably quite pissed off that you killed their dad. That, and I imagine the king would just be looking at him like, oh, well, you know, they did steal from you. So I guess fair. Fair. Fair is fair. You know? Yeah. Now, I can't speak to the other men who were on trial. Um, aside from William's son, who was also called William, he also escaped unscathed. Yes. But I don't know what the eventual fate of the other men was. Mm-hmm. But even this wasn't the end of William's shenanigans. I was just going to say they'll be dead now, whatever their fate was. Unless. Oh. <laughs> other shenanigans? Yeah, because why wouldn't it be? He's literally just gotten away with murder, so... Well, that's going to put you on a bit of a high, really, isn't it? <laughs> you're, you're, you're never going to die. Yeah, I'm going to live forever! <laughs> Two years later, in 1494... Yep. You with me? I'm with you. William was on trial again. What now? Well, for what, I can't find. Oh. I I don't know. It was just described in a lot of places as just criminal acts and (laughs) criminal actions. I I don't know. But he and his accomplices were sentenced to beheading. Oh. So whatever it was, it was no joke. It must have been something against the king this time. Maybe. Or something the king... Or maybe the king just got fed up. Yeah. We've talked about it before, but beheading was considered the more civilised execution so yes. if you were of no noble blood you would be beheaded rather than hanged yes i remember that yes we've talked about that a few times i think i think so i think it's come up but once again william was pardoned by king james what jammy bastard Just going about murdering and god knows what else god knows what well he's gonna be really riding high now isn't mm-hmm. he well this seems to be where his run ends oh yeah the year before this in 1493 um because i think in 1494 that's when he was pardoned so i don't know how long he was imprisoned or on trial for yes he was on trial in aberdeen not here okay the year before in 1493 william had actually given up his title and the estates to his son john oh okay not just give them up generally no he'd given them up to his son uh, but John wasn't his eldest son. Oh. Because remember I talked about William before. Yep. Who was his eldest. William, his eldest son, gave up becoming Thane of Cawdor in favour of joining the church. Oh. oh there were nice. reports that he was, quote, lame and weak of body. Oh. Unquote. But I wonder if it's the result of a guilty conscience. Maybe. Or some kind of under the table dealie, be like, well, I'll let you live. But you can't be Thane. Yeah. That does seem more likely. And William giving up his titles like that. And if you slaughter someone, you're going to need some resolve to just carry on day by day. Yeesht. Yep. So he had given up everything to his second son. Or oh. Third son. Second son. So he was just enjoying his retirement, getting I, up to nefarious acts. Yeah, it's confusing. I don't know if he did that so that... Calder or Calder could run without him while he was going through all of this. Yeah, I'm really not sure. I couldn't find an exact reason. But William also tried... So he's the the seventh thing who we've been talking about, William. He also tried to mend things with the roses at Kill Rock. Oh. Because he had locked up his son, Uh the Baron's son. Because he organised for John, the new thing, to marry a woman called Isabella Rose. Ooh. Tactical. Who is from Kilrock, and I think was the sister of the boy that William had locked up. She was the daughter of the Baron of Kilrock. I wonder if he went to the wedding, the son who was locked up. Mm. Either you would avoid the whole thing, or you'd go and have a wild one. Yeah. (laughs) Do it on their dollar. 
Now, I don't know if I said already, but the Baron of Kilrock was called Hugh. Yes. Hugh Rose. Because I wanted to make a joke about huge roses and decided not to. Uh, okay, so I, ha- I have said that. Yep. So John's married Isabella, Hugh's daughter. This is going to be important. Oh, okay, okay. That's why I want to make sure that I'd said it. <laughs> I can't imagine having a multi-generational family feud. Surprisingly common in Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why the clan system collapsed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so killing each other. <laughs> It's like that bit in The Simpsons with um, Groundskeeper Willie. Yeah. Scots ruining Scotland. Yeah, hate everybody. And the Scots. <laughs> oh, those Scots ruined Scotland. <laughs> Same energy. <laughs> We're getting to one of the most famous and interesting stories associated with Codder now. Ooh. We've talked again and again on the podcast about how important lines of succession were yes. for noble families and royal families. Yep. They needed to have things secure to make sure that property and belongings and wealth would stay in the family Mm -hmm. and no one could swoop in, like no rivals could take things. Nothing's more important than keeping it in the family. Yes. It's icky, but yes. (laughs) William had given up everything to his son John, like I said. Yep. But John died while William was still living. Oh, no. John died in 1494. Oh, I, I can't imagine that being, because that would be so upsetting. But then just to have the double upset of like, oh no, is this the end of the family line that we've yeah. had for seven generations? When that, that would be everything. Yeah, when that's as important as they think it is. Mm-hmm. Several months after John's death, his only surviving child was born. He had two daughters total. But it was several months after his death that his daughter Muriel was born. Mm. Muriel Calder. Can you see the problem that's coming? There's no men. Yes. But without a penis, what are we going to do? I know. I know. Shock, horror. Whatever (laughs) will we do? However will we go on? How will we get by? William was still alive when Muriel was born. His granddaughter. And it seems he was in a bit of a stoosh about the whole thing. <clears throat> because when John died, he did his best to try and make sure the title would go to one of his other sons. Uh-huh. But that didn't happen. He couldn't go back and change what he had decided. Oh, really? I'm not sure what prevented him from changing the plan. There was something that meant he couldn't. <clears throat> Bureaucracy. Something. There was something, because he had already changed it to give it to John, he couldn't change it. Yeah. I don't know. So Muriel was William's heir. Yep, okay. Uh And set to become an extremely powerful and wealthy woman. Good. We need more of them. (laughs) (laughs) Balance out all the testosterone flowing around these castles. No, I know. Get rid. (laughs) Get rid. Now, remember who Muriel's mother was? Um, Thingy Rose. Yes. Isabel Rose. Her mother was Isabella Rose of Kilrock. Yep. The deaths of John and later William, he's not quite dead yet, are pretty good news for the Roses. Yep. Because that would make Muriel the new Thane upon William's death. And the Baron of Kilrock, Hugh Rose, Mm -hmm. was manoeuvring to make the most of this good fortune. I could see why he would. Getting the pieces in place for when William dies. Yeah, things looking pretty rosy for him. How long have you wanted to say that? (laughs) Tell me the minutes. I know know you've been counting down. What do you mean? (laughs) I just thought of that right now. I can see you sweating. (laughs) Holding it in. You look pale. (laughs) Hugh planned to marry Muriel off within the Rose family. He wanted to marry her off to one of his grandsons, which would make her future husband her cousin. Mm. Because Hugh is also her grandfather. Yep. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It's just all Not morally, but (laughs) (laughs) you can follow the, the path. Yes. Yep. He he wanted to try and pull all of the power of the Calder name into Kilrock. Yeah. But with so much power and wealth on the table, Muriel's position and her future had drawn lots of eyes and lots of attention, not just from Hugh. Mm. He wasn't the only one who had plans for her, even though she's still just a child. Yeah. Archibald Campbell, the second Earl of Argyll, 
had his eye on the fortune of Cawdor. Interesting. He was already a very powerful man. We've talked about the Campbells before. Yep. A lot of power. He was the master of the household to King James IV, who we just talked about. Sounds like a big deal. And he was the Lord Chancellor of Scotland. So he wielded a lot of power when it came to delivering justice and delivering the law. Yeah, that's pretty cool. He was literally raised in a place called Castle Gloom. (laughs) Which was later called Castle Campbell. I can see why they changed the name. And it's just outside Dollar. (laughs) I really want to go. I want to go see Castle Gloom. Archibald knew just how wealthy and powerful Muriel would grow to be. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to bring her into his family so he would get the benefit. He heard what Hugh Rose was planning to do and he decided he wasn't having any of that. So he came up with a plan of his own for poor, poor Muriel. God. One of Hugh Rose's sons had made a big mistake. He had joined in with one of his cousins from a different clan Mm -hmm. in, quote, spoiling the lands of Alexander Uckert of Cromarty, Mm. unquote. I'm not sure exactly what this means. I'm wondering if it's causing damage that stops anyone from being able to farm the land. Yeah, I wonder. But um, that's not clear. Yeah. Burning the land or something. Something to that effect. Something that causes Mm. a lot of harm. Archibald found out about this uh-huh. and he knew he had an advantage now. Remember, he's the Lord Chancellor. Yes. He can swing his dick in and sort things out. All men, really. Yeah, pretty much. Big <laughs> dick swinger. He offered the Roses a deal. He would basically absolve Hugh's son of guilt mm-hmm. and let him off with a fine instead of anything more severe. But in return, Archibald wanted to be made Muriel's guardian. So she would become his ward. Oh, not this again. Yes, which meant he would be allowed to arrange her marriage. This was uh, come long in Castle. Yes, this it's the same thing again. There was a horrendous story in that episode. And I think that might have been Campbell's too. Uh, I can't remember. Comment if you remember. Neither yeah. of us remember. Might be Mackenzie's, I think. I can't remember. That might have been a Donald as well. Anyway. So that was what he proposed. And in the end... This deal was accepted, but Hugh was made her joint guardian. Ooh. So she had two. Two with very opposing ideas. Yes, but both selfish. Yes. Is that better? Is that worse? I don't really know. Muriel was kept and raised at Kilrock Castle for the first couple years of her life. She was tutored and kept safe. Archibald had managed to come to a friendly arrangement with Hugh about the whole thing. <clears throat> the men agreed to keep things civil. They signed like a document of friendship so that there wouldn't be any arguments. Yep. But this didn't last. The date differs from 1499 to 1505. Mm-hmm. I'm more inclined to believe the earlier date. But more in this episode than most, there's two versions of everything. That's really weird. It's bizarre. Yeah. You, like between what the guidebook says and what the castle has and what's spread about online, it varies wildly. Strange. Anyway, Archibald raised a force of about 60 Campbell men to march on Kilrock. Now, Archibald's claim for this action, his reason, was that Muriel should be educated down south with them at mm-hmm. Inverary Castle. Inverary is the heart of Campbell land. We talked about that in the App and Murder episode. Yes. But this wasn't his true motive, as you can probably guess. He doesn't care that much about her education. Yeah. Uh, It's basically all a ruse to try and bring her into Campbell forts. Yes. So then he could marry her off. He just wants a more immediate claim over her. Yeah, and he, he wants the title, he wants the fortune. Yeah. No, oh, sorry. Oh, just a friendly 60 men escort. Mm-hmm. We just thought this would be totally chill to send these 60 soldiers to collect her. Mm-hmm. Which we haven't discussed. Yeah. It's just going to happen. Now, there's rumours that efforts were made to mark Muriel oh. in some way uh, to make sure that only she could claim to be the heir to Cotter. Oh, okay. So no one else could just find another girl who would kind of like her and claim she was Muriel. Do the old switcheroo. Mm -hmm. Two things were done. 
The first rumour is that Muriel was branded with the key to Kilrock Castle. Very nice. And it was either her nurse or the Lady Kilrock, her grandmother. Did you say branded? Yes. I thought you said handed. Branded. That's much worse. That's not very nice. No. Uh, And either on her hip or her thigh. Yeah. Uh, The story is that the key was put into the fire and then it was pressed against her leg. So that you couldn't deny it was her. It's for your own good. Yeah. The other rumour is that the tip of her pinky finger from her left hand was either cut or bitten off. Oh, Oh, no. I guess it's a good identifier because you can't really cover that up. But yeah, not cool to do that to a small child. You can't just bite people's fingers off. Yeah. We told it to the dog. We tell it to everybody who comes over. <laughs> it's a house rule. Well, that's grim. And again, there are different versions of this story. In some, this happens to Muriel when she's very young, before there's any real threat, but they're thinking ahead. The other version is that Lady Kilrock found out that the Campbells were coming. And that was when she came up with a way to make sure Muriel wouldn't be hurt if she was taken away. It's given rise to the saying, quick, the Campbells are coming, brand your children. <laughs> that is a common saying. <laughs> if, I had, if I had a penny for every time I heard that. I'd, I'd have one penny. <laughs> I'd be exactly where I am now. <laughs> the Campbells arrived at Kilrock, led by a man called Campbell of Inverleaver. I can't find out much about him. I can't even find out his first name. Mm -hmm. He's only referred to in lots of places as Campbell of Inverleaver. So I'm just going to go with it. Yep, yep. They descended on Kilrock Castle and made their claim on Muriel. And like I said, they were there under the guise of taking her to Inverary so she could receive a good education, a good southern education. But no one believed this. No. But it was equally difficult to dispute them. Because there were 60 men. It's uh, not a position you want to be in. No. Their hand is being forced. It, there's not really much they can do, especially because it, it is under this excuse of getting a good education. Yeah. If, she, if they're going to be good guardians to her, they want that for her. Yeah. So it's tricky. Muriel was handed over to the Campbells, but they didn't get very far. Yeah. Because Muriel's uncles, Alexander and Hugh Calder, uh-huh. so relations on the Calder side, <clears throat> brothers of her father they pursued the Campbells with all of their men and they actually outnumbered the Campbells oh wow they were absolutely not happy with this arrangement they didn't want her to be taken away yeah. down to Inverary so they decided they were going to stop whatever the Campbells had planned I'd actually forgotten she has family oh yeah because it's strange that her uncles didn't become her ward well I guess because father's dead and her mother took her to where she was from yeah <clears throat> and because like her mother is not the thing oh and that's true because the the guy who's her ward at Kilverock castle hugh mm-hmm. is her grandfather yeah. isn't he so yeah there is that actually well i'm glad the uncle stepped in nonetheless to be like um can you not steal my niece please yeah they intercepted the campbells at dal tulloch which is south of Aldern and Brody. Okay. Not far from here at all. The opposing forces clashed in what became known as the Battle of Dal Tullough. Mm. And I read it described as a, quote, tactical Calder victory, unquote. Very nice. Because the Campbells were outnumbered by the Calders, and by all accounts, the Campbells suffered way more losses. Campbell of Inverleaver suffered very personal losses in oh, this yeah. battle. Oh, yeah. Because anywhere or somewhere between six and eight of his sons were killed in the battle. Ooh, and that's he, not a good feeling. And he's the reason they died. Eesht. Which is even worse. Good luck to that guy moving forward. Mm-hmm. I'll explain. The battle is also deemed a, quote, strategic Campbell victory, unquote. Okay. Because Muriel wasn't rescued by her uncles in the end. Oh, Campbell of Inverleaver lost all of his sons, but he managed to outfox the Calders and steal Muriel away. Did he just bail? Kind of, yeah. There are two different versions how he managed this. Both are quite cartoonish. (laughs) In the first, a sheaf of corn, or some kind of bundle, was made to look like Muriel. (laughs) 
I remember she's still quite young. Mm-hmm. If the battle did happen in 1499, then she was only four or five. And you're going to be looking at the guy in front of you with a sword. Yeah. Not the person you're coming for. You'll yeah. get them after the fact. So they bundled up some corn to make it look like a small child, and they used this as a decoy. Campbell of Inverleaver ordered his sons to defend this bundle of corn as if it were really the child. Ah. When really, he had Muriel himself and escaped the battle while the callers were occupied with the fighting. And Campbell's sons were killed in their attempt to keep the callers away from some corn. Mm. That's, I mean, they did a good job, I guess. Now, what's bothering me is that in this version, they're talking about a sheaf of corn. Uh Uh-huh. But I don't think corn is a native plant to Scotland. I wondered when you said corn. But I'm not sure how the timelines match up with going to the new world and bringing back corn. Mm. It's more likely to me that it was barley or wheat. Yeah, that seems more probable. Just wanted to say that because that's the version I read, but that bothers me because I don't think that's quite right but I don't have enough information. No, that seems we can go into that tangent in the blether. Yes, which you can find over on Patreon, you can come join us there, thank you very much. (laughs) The other version of the story is a little bit different. (laughs) It says that Campbell turned a camp kettle upside down, so it's like a a big pot Mm -hmm. to make it look like they were using this to protect Muriel from harm, that she was inside the kettle underneath it because it was made of metal. Yep, hope it wasn't hot. (laughs) And in this version, the same thing happened. He ordered his sons to defend the camp kettle like she was really underneath it. They're killed, only for the Calders to discover they've been deceived and their niece is miles away. Blast drat and damn it. We've been befuddled. (laughs) It's the PG version of the podcast. (laughs) Campbell of Inverleaver managed to make it to Inverary with Muriel. And reportedly, when asked what might have happened if Muriel had been accidentally killed... During this battle, he said, Muriel of Cawdor will never die as long as there's a red-headed lassie on the shores of Loch Awe. Bit random? Very prophetic? No, it's scheming and fiendish. Oh. Doesn't matter if Muriel of Cawdor dies as long as there's a girl who looks just like her on Campbell Land. Oh, I understand. You see it? I see it now. I missed it before, but now I see it. Ooh. And this quote is attributed to several different people Uh across different documents, but for my story, it works here, so I'm keeping it. Sounds good. And basically proves the reason that Muriel needed to be branded in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Muriel was taken to Inverary, and she was raised as a Campbell. Fine. Sounds fine. They they raised her as one of their own. And in 1502, which is what makes me think that this happened in 1499, not 1505. Yep. In 1502, Muriel's grandfather, William, died. Okay, yep. Making her officially the new Thane, when she was only about seven. I'm with you. I'm with you. So Archibald Campbell pretty much got exactly what he wanted. Because in 1510, when Muriel was 12, and therefore totally of marrying age, (laughs) it's gross and it's wrong and I hate it, she was married to one of Archibald's sons, a man called Sir John Campbell. Well, isn't that handy? Isn't that good? Mm, At 12. At 12. Gross. Yeah. Well, that explains why there's quite a lot of portraits of Campbells in the castle. Yes, Because now she was officially a Campbell. Archibald had won, he had the Codder name, and Codder is still owned and lived in by Campbells. Hmm. This is where it comes from. Oh, so it's still a Campbell castle. Yes. Do you think... like Campbell Codder or the Campbells of Codder specifically, because there's lots of branches of Campbells. It's a big family. there are. Huh. So they, that's where the Campbell comes from. That's why there's so many portraits in the castle of Campbells. That's why there's so many Campbell pictures. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's where the Campbell name at Codder comes from. Well, there you go. Do you think they have a tradition that all the women of the family have to get branded in honour of their great-great-granny? I really hope not. Yeah, me too. Because that would suck. It'd be a bit brutal, wouldn't it? 
<laughs> now, it would be a long time before Muriel returned to Codder with her okay. new husband. They lived in Argyll, which was where the Campbells had most of their land. Mm. Uh, they didn't live in Codder uh, until much later. And the reason they returned to the Highlands is kind of spicy. Ooh, hit me. If, if you want to hear it. I'm ready for some spice. I was feeling a bit bland. If you were feeling bland? I just want to be spiced up. After, after the Muriel story, it's a good one. It is a good one. Well, we need to look at her husband, John Campbell. He had a sister who was either called Elizabeth or Catherine. <laughs> I've seen her referred to as both. The Codder guidebook says Elizabeth, but lots of places across the internet say Catherine. Mm. So I'm going to go with Catherine. Sure. It seems like that's what she was known by. Catherine was married to an absolute rotter. <laughs> a man called Lachlan McLean. And they hadn't had any children. How dare they? I know. I know. How very dare they? And the story goes that Lachlan blamed Catherine for this, the oh. arsehole. He blamed her for the fact they hadn't been able to have any children. Yep. Other stories say that he just got sick of her, her being around and having to see her and talk to her and all that good stuff. <laughs> you know what that's like. No, we don't all know what that's like. I said you'll know what that's like. Mm. Because of stuff like this. Mm. <laughs> so, do you want to know what he did? Yes. In either 1523 or 1527, <laughs> I don't know which one, he chained her to a big rock. Oh, that's uh, an interesting strategy. Yeah, called the Lady's Rock. And it's southwest of the Isle of Lismore. Huh. So further south. Yep. He chained her there, completely naked, and left her there for the tide to come in and drown her. I wondered if it was going to be in the water. Grim. Yeah. Absolutely grim. Yep. You should have tried marriage counselling. <laughs> That's not good conflict, conflict resolution. A better intermediary step <laughs> than murder. Than murder. Yeah. Oh. And he was really conniving too. He could see the rock from his home at Duart Castle. He checked the rock the next morning after like having slept and you have like a full run of the tide or whatever. Yep. And he couldn't see Catherine on it anymore. Her body was completely gone. And he was chuffed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. His stupid wife was gone. Yay. So he decided to send a letter of condolence to the Earl of Argyll at Inverary Castle. Archibald Campbell, uh -huh. who was the son of the Archibald Campbell we spoke about earlier. Okay. Because John Campbell wasn't the eldest son. Gotcha. So he didn't inherit the Earl title. That makes sense. You with me? Yep. The Campbells, like I said, were a really powerful family. Mm -hmm. And I read that the title Earl of Argyll was really only second to the king himself. Wow. They were a big deal. So Lachlan was taking a huge risk in murdering Archibald Campbell's and John Campbell's sister. Bold move. But he was committed to the lie. He sent the letter informing Catherine's family of her death and that he was going to bring her body to Inverary so she could be buried there. Oh, is he going to just kill somebody else to get a body? Well, that's what I wondered. I, d I don't know. Because he didn't have a body. He didn't have a body. Because it was gone. Yep. But... He's he's committed. Like I said, he makes a huge scene, yep. travels to Inverary Castle with a huge retinue of men and a coffin. Oh. So. Even though, like the skeleton who's afraid of the dance, he has no body to go with. Nope. So I don't know if this was an empty coffin or if they filled it with just something to make it something heavy. Something to make it heavy. Or if they killed someone who looked kind of like her. Yeah. I don't know. It, nothing is said. But Lachlan arrives, ready to mourn, and it's all bullshit. Please say she's already there. <laughs> Please say she escaped and she's just there already to be like, Whoa, I'm actually alive. And then they all get him. <laughs> they all get him. They all get him. He reaches the Great Hall at Inverary Castle, where a big feast has been waiting for his arrival. Because he's an important guy and mm -hmm. you know they're in mourning, so big feast. 
But when he walks in, Catherine is sitting at the head of the table. You! <laughs> now I have in my notes, can you believe it? But you obviously can, because <laughs> you just guessed the whole thing. <laughs> she was already there. Already there. And she was just sitting at the table, waiting for him. Hello. With her brother. Hello, John. I've forgotten his name already. Lachlan. Lachlan. <laughs> Now, it turns out... Pleased to see me, eyebrow raise. <laughs> Looking a bit alive, am I? <laughs> you look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> Wait, let me get to it. It's, it's even better than that. It turns out, whether it was dumb luck uh -huh. or fate, Catherine was spotted before she drowned by some fishermen who were sailing about. And they rescued her, thankfully, before the tide completely submerged her. Wow. They managed to get her. And uh, there were different versions, whether she was chained to the rock or just stranded there because mm -hmm. she wouldn't be able to swim to shore. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. Who knows? They rescued her. And I can't imagine what must have been going through Lachlan's head. Because this is about the worst thing that could happen for him. Yeah. But what they did was they proceeded with their meal completely as planned that's the most british thing i've ever heard neither catherine <laughs> nor her super powerful pissed <laughs> older brother archibald campbell said anything about what lachlan had done to her during the dinner they didn't oh. address it at all they what? made him sit in it and had dinner together like it was the most normal thing in the world that Lachlan had just shown up with her coffin, ready to mourn her after murdering her. Wow. That's ballsy. Isn't it wild? Unusual. Lachlan was allowed to leave Inverary Castle with his head. Um, why? How? What? They just, they just had dinner and then he left. Mm-hmm. But not long after... I know, what's the play here? Lachlan was found dead in Edinburgh after being stabbed to death. So I, uh, he didn't know when it was coming. Oh, that's... Oh, it's, I think that's about the most dastardly thing you can do because he's left in Vereri. They haven't talked about it. They obviously know everything. Yep. And he just has to leave and go about his life. Weirdly, it's almost cruel. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's possibly the best thing they could have done. Yeah. Oh. Revenge-wise, not going to, to heaven-wise. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn. What do you think about that? I'm just, I'm just kind of stunned. I told you it was spicy. Yes, so this leads to them coming back to Cotter. Well... Three guesses who killed Lachlan McLean. Um, I can't remember his name, so I'm out. <laughs> John Campbell. He's John Campbell, yes. Catherine's brother and Muriel's husband. It's widely thought that John was the one responsible for the murder of his brother-in-law, but he never suffered any repercussions for this. Mm. You know, he didn't, he was never charged. But to avoid any trouble or anything starting, it was recommended that John and Muriel make the move to Cotter, out of Campbell lands, away from the scene of the crime, just to avoid any kind of uproar. So this is what took the couple back to Cotter in the 1520s. Damn. Catherine sends her regards. Right, right. And the Codders are back in Cotter. The Campbell Codders. Yes, they're back. Well. Now one of... Muriel's other sisters-in-law. I'll have to look into it. I might make it a mini episode. I'll see how we get on. She was tried and burned as a witch. Oh. Janet Douglas. Oh, man. She was one of the sisters-in-law. But I'll have a look at that because I don't have all the details. And this was already long enough. Like, I can't, can't include this as well. That's just nonsense. It's nonsense. John and Muriel back at Cotter. Yes. John possibly for the first time. So it's not where he was from. But they weren't welcome I mean, back with open arms. Well, they've been gone a long time. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be in charge. 
and the Calder family are still in the area and they're still pissed yeah. at the Campbells for taking away the title and the fortune. Yeah, I can't see them being welcome back. Muriel's uncles were still there and the, the same ones who had fought for her to save her from the Campbells actually tried to block their entry into the castle. Well, she won't know them, presumably. No. Not very well, anyway. So her uncles banded together to try and forcibly keep them out. And it seems like they attacked the castle to try and make them leave. Wow. But the the siege, the attack, came to an end when two of Muriel's uncles were killed Ooh. in the fight. The Calders gave up on their efforts and retreated. So they left Cotter Castle in the hands of the Campbells. Damn. Thus ending the line of the Calders with regards to the castle, presumably. Well, yeah, the ones who were in control of the castle. Yeah. Muriel ended up having a, a reasonably happy marriage. Good. According oh. to all accounts, they were really happy together. Thus ends the Calders of Cotter. That's yes. what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yep. And she had a long life. She lived until she was into her 70s. Very good. So all in all, she was okay. She did fine. She got her birthright. Nasty just, scar, but... She was forced into a marriage, but just about every woman was... Well, Which doesn't yes. make it okay, but it's just what happened. Unfortunately, her eldest son died before she did. Oh. Which is almost kind of ironic because that's what happened to her father. Yeah. So she left Cotter Castle to her grandson, who was called John Campbell. Because when you've got a perfectly good name, why get a different one? Just reuse that bad boy. Yeah. This John Campbell, Muriel's grandson met a pretty grisly end, mm. although it didn't happen at Cotter. He became a very powerful man. Even in terms of the Campbells, he was a, he was a powerful Campbell. Oh, okay. which was it's a different more scale, than, yeah. yeah. He had a lot of land, a lot of influence all over the country, and he was actually making some of the other Campbells jealous. Oh, wow. That's how well he was doing. And in the late 1500s, he was shot while he slept in his chair by a blunderbuss that was pointed through an open window at him. Oh my god, that's a brutal way to go. Yep. It's like the least stealthy sniper I've ever heard. Yep, but it gets the job done. It, a blunderbuss would get the job done. <laughs> Rip out half the room as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Heavens. And his murder was masterminded by a Campbell, Duncan oh. Campbell of Glenor Glenorchy? Glenorchy? Anarchy! <laughs> but he was known as Black Duncan. Mm. Very evil. And he managed to weasel out of any punishment for this, basically because he signed a document saying he knew nothing about it. That, that would do it. <laughs> yeah, he was shot with a blunderbuss. Was, was it you? No. Well, we've got nothing well, else to go on, even so worse okay. than that, the, the guy who like, spilled the beans on the plot, because this murder was part of a string of murders that were either oh, carried out or planned, so that this Duncan could take what he wanted yeah it's like a crime wave yeah it was this whole whole scheme and the guy who outed the whole plan this guy black duncan basically signed a document saying oh well he planned it i didn't know anything about that he's trying to frame me to make me look bad uh, so even though he's been honest he's fucked i see i see so he's done what the guy in tiger king did yeah <laughs> he owns tiger king's Zoo. Mm -hmm. Bastard. Right? We've made it to the 1600s. We've survived. We've made it. Yes. This is where we are in Cotter's history now. Let's take a breath. Mm -hmm. Let's take a moment to soak in the last 600, 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, the last 500 years of history. I can do maths. <laughs> It was during this century that the 12th Thane of Cotter literally bought the island of Islay. That's pretty cool. He bought the whole thing. Damn. But it turned out to be a real ball ache for him because he struggled to actually impose his ownership. Oh. <laughs> because he couldn't get rent from anyone. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a whole thing. like They had to get warships to attack the island and try to bring the islanders to heel. Damn. But he had a really hard time trying to make his money back from buying the island. Do you think that was the medieval equivalent of like buying a football club? Well, no. The King King James at the time 
he was quite happy for the Thane of Codger to do this because he wanted to try and make more money from the islands. Yes. So if the Thane is getting money, he can tax him Yep. to try and make money from these territories that he's found it hard to maintain. Well, yeah, because presumably they weren't paying him and then stopped paying the Thane. Yeah, so he was quite happy just to let him do that. So I don't even know if it was a status thing. I think he genuinely thought he would make lots of money and all the islanders were just like, no. Nah. Yeah, he just got, <laughs> he almost got tricked into like, oh yeah, you buy the island, you make loads of rent, it'll be great. Free whiskey, lovely. Yeah, it's like, we, we don't owe you shit. Like, I don't care if you own the island. I, yeah. I don't know you. I don't, what? So we never sold it. You can't own it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the tw- same 12th thing who had the church built in Codder. And as far as I know, it's the one that's still standing. It's a, it's a good church. It certainly looks old enough. Big and grand. there's a lot of really ancient looking trees uh-huh. in the cemetery. The 12th Thane's son, the 13th Thane. 13th Thane. Who was also called John. That's easy for you to say. Was actually certified as in Thane <laughs> in the 1600s. He's in Thane? Mm-hmm. Oh no. The 13th Thane is in Thane. That's terrible to hear that. I thought, I thought you'd like that. I did like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was certified insane. I have no idea what he suffered from. I don't know what kind of illness it was that... Probably 12 generations of inbreeding. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but he was... Uh, from what I would, from what I read, it seemed like he was a danger to himself. Oh, that's a shame. Um, he wasn't able to control himself particularly well, so he couldn't be the Thane of Cotter. Yeah. The talk of the town was that his wife was poisoning him. Oh. And that's what sent him insane. Oh my God. Uh, the guidebook from Codder mentions that after one of her dinner parties, three of her guests were found dead in their beds the following morning. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a good hosting move, is it? <laughs> well, it sounds like a poisoning gone wrong. Yeah. It also says this, which I have for you. On a previous occasion, one of the Codder Campbell ladies was poisoned by her husband's family, the Rosses of Balnagowan, assisted by the Monroes of Fowles. Fowles? Monroes of Fowles. To a degree where she was ill for the rest of her days. Oh, wow. As a result of arsenic rat bait in the broth. Oh. Oh, no. So poisoning was pretty rife at this time because you could get away with it. Yeah. Ill to the end of your days because you've been poisoned. Permanent damage. That's mental. Well, I'm going to be keeping an eye on my soup tonight. <laughs> You're not even getting soup. <clears throat> Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> the 13th Thane's son, mm-hmm. so the insane Thane's son, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> died of the plague. Oh, that's... Oh, man, things are not going well. But what's weirdly funny to me is that he died of the plague at Glasgow Uni. And I don't know why that's funny. I mean, I think there's a few people have woken up in the mornings at Glasgow Uni (laughs) believing they have the plague. You know where you get all the warnings when you go to uni about, like, make sure you have your meningitis jab and, like, you're going to get sick from everybody because nobody looks after themselves and shared accommodation. What's the kissing one that sometimes goes around unis? I can't remember. It's like the kissing flu thing. Herpes? No, it's not as bad (laughs) as herpes. (laughs) But yeah, stuff like that. It's not the plague, though. But it's that vibe. It's this... Aristocratic, aristocratic son going off to Freshers Week and then dying of the plague. Yeah. Oh no, that's not good at all. Mono. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about now. Glandular fever. You can get that from kissing and smooching it up. It's no plague, but no, no, it's not the plague. But as far as I know, it's pretty bad. I've yeah. never had glandular fever, and I'm kind of glad. Now I have a good story for you involving the next thing of Cotter. The fifteenth. Uh, Yes, so to be clear, you have number 13, who was insane and couldn't perform his duties. Yep. But then his son died. Yep. So it was the insane man's brother who inherited the Thanage. Okay. And he was called Hugh. Thanage? Yeah. Thanery. I'm I'm pretty sure it's Thanage. I think I saw that in my research. He's now the Thane, and that's who I'm talking about. 
So we kind of moved sideways a little bit. Yeah, so instead of going to the son, it's gone to the brother. Yep. A man called Callum Begg was brought to Hugh because he was caught stealing sheep. Why was he brought to me? (laughs) Would you like me to continue? Yes, please. He was caught stealing sheep and he was caught with a lamb in his hands. Oh. So there's not really a lot of wriggle room there. No, that's... Caught red-handed. Yeah, very much so. Naughty, naughty boy. No, naughty boy. <laughs> He's not the messiah. He's a very naughty boy. Is that a lamb? Uh, that's a cloud, mate. This is my comfort pillow. I actually took this lamb from home. This is pillbow baggins. <laughs> Caught red-handed. He's locked away in the dungeon room of the castle. Yep. It seems, along with the lamb, because this is the proof of what he's done. Uh, fair enough, I suppose, yeah. But Hugh quite liked Callum. Oh, yeah. It seemed like they had quite a good relationship and he had helped him with stuff before. And he didn't really want to punish him for stealing. Not least because the sentence could be death. That's an affable gentleman right there. It, proof in the pudding that if you're charming, it can get you surprisingly far. Yeah, just a wee smile on it. Uh Oh, you caught me, eh? Can't really get away with this one. That's that's what it seems like. (laughs) So Hugh went down to the dungeon to talk to Callum, specifically to ask him if he had a good knife. Callum told him that he did. Hmm. So Hugh replied cryptically, then I shall bring customers for your weather. Oh, I don't know what that means. Well, luckily Callum did. That's good. Once Hugh was gone, Callum took the knife to the lamb that Mm. was locked in the dungeon with him and butchered it. He he knew how to do that. Yep. And after that, he threw the pieces of meat out the window of the dungeon. Yep. They all landed on the ground outside and he started cleaning himself and the space up. So there was no evidence of what he'd done. Wouldn't you know it that at that very moment, Hugh released his hounds? Oh, into the grounds of the castle. They immediately smelled the butchered lamb, the yep. meat, and made short work of it. As they would. Munching it down. I'm imagining <clears throat> him having Irish wolfhounds. Oh, yeah, big, nice. Oh, and I love them so much. Yep. I want one. It's funny if you imagine him with, like, a cockapoo. Also cute. Both. Well, one of each. <laughs> yeah. Little and large. Yeah. <laughs> They eat the lamb. So when it came time to charge Callum Begg, there was no proof of his crime. Oh, well, there you go. There was no lamb in his cell. There was no proof that he had stolen anything. So he was released. That's a charmer right there. That's a man with a good smile. Unfortunately, he didn't change his ways. He ended up being hanged at Kilrock Castle for doing exactly the same thing a few months later. A few months later? Yeah. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's a shame. So Hugh tried. He tried. But what can you do? What can you do? <laughs> Can't change the zebra stripes or something. Like I think that. that's one, yeah. Leopard spots. Leopard spots. Tiger stripes. The sheep's wool. Wait, you change that every year? It, it does shear off, yes. Yeah. The 1700s were fairly quiet for Calder Castle, to be honest. I just have a couple of juicy tidbits for you. Please. To make up the hundred years or so. Firstly, Samuel Johnson published his dictionary. Not this guy again. Your old friend. I had such rage about this guy in a different episode. and I I again can't remember which one. Sonny Bean, baby. Ah, yes. Sort of season three. Yes. That's why I'm including this, because it's not strictly related. You just want to rage me out. Yes. The 16th Thane of Cotter, mm-hmm. was pretty upset about how Johnson described oats in his dictionary. O-A-T-S. What's wrong with oats? Well, would you like to hear how Samuel Johnson objectively defined oats in his dictionary? Yes. Uh, yeah, He wrote the dictionary and he had not very nice things to say about Scotland. Yes. If you would like to hear them, the Sonny Bean episode. Really, to fully enjoy it, listen to the Sonny Bean episode because... You'll hear Kieran's rage in real time, and honestly, it's better than secondhand rage. <laughs> <laughs> but you are you are about to get a helping of first-hand rage. Here's your residual check of rage. Yes. So, oats. Oats. 
noun. A green, which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. That bastard. Oh, you just hate him so much. <laughs> I'm no porridge when he comes to my house, let me tell you. His dad was Scottish. What is this guy's deal? Oh, what is his deal? His dad obviously told him how much better Scotland was his whole life, and he went, fuck you, I'm going to burn it to the ground. I think, I think he just tried to hide that his dad was Scottish. I don't think he wanted anyone to know. I think he was ashamed. So yeah, the Thane of Cotter wasn't happy about it. Like He wrote in letters to people how much he didn't like it. Yeah. That he had written that. Bowl of porridge is lovely. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> I thought you might enjoy it. I do not enjoy it. I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Another useless fact of note from this period in Cotter's history. Please. Is that the 16th Thane married a woman called Mary Price who had an estate in Cardiganshire. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a child, and I thought that was funny. Cardiganshire. Uh, where's Cardiganshire? Uh, England. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll double check. I didn't even look. I just, I saw the name. That was enough. That is plenty. Oh, I beg your pardon. I think it's in Wales. Not England at all. I'm very sorry. I think it's in West Wales. West Wales. Apologies. I should have checked. It just it just made me laugh. Does anybody else hear Wales and have to go never eat shredded wheat in their head? <laughs> or is that just me? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a third tidbit from the 1700s? No. Those are the fun bits. Yes, so Cardigan shares in Wales. Cool. Because there's a place called Cardigan and there's a place called Cardigan Bay. And I... I just find it funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just do. It's just kind of funny. It's just funny. Well, those are two tasty little morsels of history. Yes. During the 1700s, things were... Not much really happened at Cotter. The Campbells supported King George, as far as I know, in the Jacobite Risings, or against the Jacobite Risings. Because remember, those are in the 1700s. Yep. Um, and it was in 1692 that another branch of the Campbells carried out the massacre at Glencoe okay, yep. on the side of the crown. Mm. So that's kind of where their allegiance lies. Yes. But there really isn't much to say about the Campbell Codders and Culloden. I had a look across the internet and in the guidebook it says, the only family letter to survive at the time of the Battle of Culloden is a note written by Price, the 17th Thane, mm -hmm. as a Cambridge undergraduate describing no more than the fireworks and student shindy in the town huh. in relief over the Highlanders' defeat. All else is silence. Crazy. It's even weird that there's such jubilation about it, but there would be. Because in was... Cambridge? Yeah, yeah. Well, because I think the fear was this image of the Highlander. Yeah, and of course. The Bonnie Prince Charlie had his sights on London. He wanted to take London. As part of the propaganda machine that was running at the time. Yeah, on both sides. Yep. Because Charlie was saying they could do it and uh -huh. it was his birthright. If you want to know more, we have a an epic episode on Culloden. We do. And you can go visit with a National Trust membership. Oh! oh. So during Culloden, I think the Campbells were largely on the side of the crown. Yes. Based on what I've been able to see. And Codder Castle survived the carnage of the Rising. It wasn't really damaged, not even really attacked at all. Oh. Um, I don't think we talked about it in the Culloden episode, but I read that after Culloden, uh -huh. when tartan was outlawed, you remember? Yep. The only tartan that was still allowed to be worn was the Black Watch tartan. Oh, really? Yes. And that's the tartan worn by the Black Watch Regiment of the British Army, which was made up of lots of Campbells. That's interesting. So the only tartan that was still allowed to be worn was a Campbell tartan. Wow. Um, a Campbell British military tartan. Yeah. Madness. Isn't it? That is. The same 16th Thane of Codder, who I spoke about before, he actually wrote a letter talking about his views of the banning of tartan. Oh, yeah. So he talked about how annoyed he was at Samuel Johnson. He's talking about the banning of tartan. And here's what he said. Yep, I like it. I think the quarrelling with plaid cloaks at best childish. 
but it's being criminal to wear a dress on one side of a river, which any man might freely put on as soon as he got on the opposite bank, and which was at the time the uniform of part of His Majesty's army, always appeared to me extremely absurd. I quite agree. Right, it's logical. Uh-huh. It's easy for him to say because he wasn't affected by the harshest punishments that were put on Highlanders. No. He wasn't living in Codder at the time. He but, was down in England. Yeah. But he didn't agree with the banning of tartan. He thought it was kind of pointless because you have people in the army who are wearing it. You can cross the border and it's fine. It's no yeah. big deal. So he didn't see the point. I mean, that's fair. Very reasonable. Right? Yeah. In 1796, John Campbell, the 18th Thane of Codder, <laughs> was made a lord. Okay. And during this time and onwards, the Campbell Codders had lots of connections and land and power in England. Are they still the Thane? Yes. Do you think they still pay the Thane dues? No idea. I wonder. No idea. I wonder if today they still have to pay yearly. And if it hasn't gone up, so they have to pay like a hundred marks. <laughs> I think it was like eight pounds. Yeah. It was something like that. But the guidebook even says that at this time, they became more English in their manner than they were Scottish. Uh, and they were living down there. They had family down there. They married down there. They were like sitting in as peers in Parliament and or the House of Lords. I was rooting for them. And so they became more English in their manner. And over the next hundred years or so, through like all the 1800s, they kind of became what you would expect of a of like the gentry. Uh-huh. So the rich and the privileged families of England. They had military careers as officers, uh, political careers with all lords and influencing politics. They made good marriages across England and Wales, oh, yeah. which made them more wealthy. Probably good for the gene pool, to be fair. (laughs) All of that stuff, that's why there's not really much I want to talk about, because it's what you would expect. Yeah. Which isn't a bad thing, it's just, it's not the most interesting thing to talk about. No. And it was in the 1800s that Codder Castle got its name. So before then it had been known as Calder. Oh yeah. But the name was changed by Lord John Campbell, who changed the name of everything, basically overnight, to Codder. (laughs) And Codder is closer to the English pronunciation of Calder. I wondered if that, I wondered if that was going to be a factor. Mm-hmm. But he also changed it to match what Shakespeare wrote in Macbeth. Oh, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Yeah, because there's a lot of Calder, Codder stuff mm-hmm. in the house, and I thought if you said Calder, like Calder, like it sounds a lot more like Calder, right? If you were to say it, that's yeah, my terrible he, posh English accent. But <laughs> he changed it in the 1800s. Oh. To be more English. Or just more in fitting with how an English person speaks. Yeah. Colder. Would you believe it actually wasn't until the 1900s that the now Earls of Codder started living in the castle permanently? Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so confusing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Give me a minute. So who was there? I guess just staff and things oh yeah they would have people running it they would visit stunt sons and such but they weren't living there That's... and yeah like other members of the family might live there well <clears throat> it's a long way from Codder to London mm-hmm. if that's where it's hip and happening mm-hmm. and, and you have much more profitable property down in England I'm sure and you're lording it up at Westminster yeah laughing at the poor people and such <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wasn't until the 1900s that's surprising uh, the guidebook doesn't say much about the more and most recent residents of Cotter. It's actually quite coy. At the end of the book, it says, as we have now reached the present generation, it is time to keep quiet. Um, I get that it's for like privacy and things, but that's very uh, suspicious. Yeah. Keep quiet. I'm like, why? What are they doing that you can't talk about it? It's just very like... I don't know. (laughs) Hoity-toity. But, you know, I looked into it. Yes. Can't keep it. It's not in the guidebook, but it will be on the internet. (laughs) Throughout the 1900s and the two world wars, a lot of the members of the Cotter family, the Campbell-Cotter, Cotter-Campbell, 
uh, fought in the world wars and were very brave and distinguished veterans. Not all of them survived. There's a big World War One monument in Cotter. Yes, so they they were distinguished members of the army during that time, and that's not to be sniffed at. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The Dowager Countess Cotter, Angelica. Wow. Lives at Cotter now. She was married to the sixth Earl of Cotter. The Dowager Countess. Mm-hmm. That's a title. Okay, mm-hmm. okay, okay. Because they're earls now. They were made. Earls. Yeah. But the sixth Earl died in 1993. Okay. She was his second wife. Ooh. And there's been some unpleasantness because he left the castle and everything to her instead of his son, Colin Campbell. Oh, interesting. Whose mum was presumably his first wife. Yes. Ooh, scandal. Mm -hmm. In 2002, she actually took her stepson to court because he moved into the castle while she was gone. <laughs> Took him to court to make him leave. Wow. So it doesn't seem like there's a good relationship between them. No. But he is next in line. So he is currently the seventh Earl of Cotter, because she's not the Earl. Uh-huh. But he doesn't live at Cotter because she lives there. Oh. That's... And she pushed for a, a bigger visitor centre and things happening at the castle that he wasn't very happy about, mm. it seems. They don't agree on what they want to do with the land and the estate. Interesting. Wow, can you imagine visiting the castle as a tourist, just wandering around, and you just hear a couple of people having a barney, Mm -hmm. but in, like, a locked-off area? Because there's a lot of, like, cleverly concealed doors and stuff to keep the living quarters separate. Oh, yeah, because it's still a family home, really. Yeah, that's a a very good idea. But that would be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There was a really interesting article that I found doing my research uh, from the New York Times, and it's from 2013. And they spoke to one of Colin Campbell's older sisters. Okay. Called Liza Campbell. And the article's titled, Son and Heir, In Britain, Daughters Cry No Fair. And she talks about how unfair it is that her younger brother, Colin, inherits when she doesn't. Yeah, that seems ridiculous. I assumed he was the eldest. Nope. He is the middle child of five children, but he's the oldest boy. Ugh. He has two older sisters. Oh, that's no use. But from what I can see, he's inherited the title uh-huh. of the seventh earl, and he's set to inherit the estate, because law states that titles and estates can only pass to male heirs. That's so stupid. Now, I don't know, I don't know how widely it changed. When Kate Middleton had her children, the law changed for the royal family that w- women and girls wouldn't be passed over anymore. So if Prince George, her oldest child, had been a girl, then she would have been in line for the throne. It seems ridiculous that it took until Kate Middleton for this to be changed. Yeah. One of the things I saw was that it wasn't even like they were changing the law to, like, change things moving forward it was kind of to bring things more in line with what had been happening anyway because you had queen victoria who reigned for a really long time and we currently have queen elizabeth who's reigned for a really long time so having female monarchs is not no. unusual so it's changing the law so that it fits that yeah but i don't know if that applies to earldoms yeah and baronies and such mm-hmm curious right liza made some really interesting comments about the system in the article i would recommend reading it she said my father always said remember to wear a safety belt because your face is your fortune that's a nice thing to tell your daughter Mm -hmm. isn't it she said i love my brother but it's a particular i love my brother but it's a peculiar situation there's one chosen one in the family and everyone else is superfluous to requirement The posh aspect of it blinds people to what is essentially sexism in a privileged minority, where girls are born less than boys. Yeah, well, it's not essentially sexism, it just is sexism, isn't it? It is, but the point she's making is that because they have lots of money and they're very wealthy, no one cares. Got you, yeah. Because you already have everything. Well, Why are you complaining? Because you just scoff when you hear it, don't you? Well, yeah, because I get that sentiment. Yeah. Well, you, you you already have everything. What are you complaining about now? But it, it is sexism. It is sexism. 
because <laughs> it's it's a very clear way that boys are born more important than girls. Well, I wonder if the ones who would change that specifically are all the other earls and such and the lords and things who are all largely men, middle children, who've already said that their middle boys or the eldest boy will get it. So they're all just locked into this system. Like, oh, well, if we change it, I wouldn't have got my power and I might have to give it to my sister. It's stupid. Really stupid. There was a great quote that was attributed to her, but I don't think it was in this article, where she said, I'm not just a chromosomal faux pas. Wow, that is fantastic. (laughs) So it was interesting. It was interesting reading her perspective. Very interesting. Because I enjoyed that she's aware of her privilege. Uh And that's why people don't really want to hear it, because she is already doing just fine. Yeah. But it is sexist. It is sexist. It's very sexist. It was interesting. I wanted to include it because I thought it was interesting. I quite agree. And as well as this, with the modern family, there are the usual privileged attitudes and scandals you would expect from a wealthy family. Colin Campbell's wife, who's the current Earl, Mm -hmm. but doesn't live there, she was a fashion editor of Vogue. Oh. And... And she promotes Highland produce down in London and all the fancy places. All the produce from the Codder estate, she sends it down there to try and promote it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they stay in Carnick, not Codder. And I think Carnick is on the other side of Drumna Drocket. Oh, okay. Sort of down the other end of Loch Ness uh-huh. from here. Pardon me, because they're not allowed to live in the family home. Yes. And one of Colin Campbell's nephews was charged with trafficking cocaine in Kenya. And the charges were dropped because he was accused of trafficking four million pounds worth of cocaine. Oh, fuck. Because he's a sugar trader and he was accused of using that as a cover to traffic drugs. Well, that's not good. But they dropped it because there wasn't enough evidence Mm. to prosecute him. Mm. So make of that what you will, it's just something I found. Seems strange he's a sugar trader. It just seems old fashioned. Well, yeah, everything about what you just said could have happened in any of the other centuries you mentioned. So that's the history. Are we on to some generally? Yeah. No, wait. The spookies. The other thing. Aha. Yes, we are into the legends and the ghost stories. Ho, 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 ho. The good bit of the episode. Yep. (laughs) Firstly, we should tackle the Macbeth problem. That sounds good to me. The Macbeth connection. The much ado about Macbeth. Wrong. (laughs) But I like it. I don't know how familiar you are with Shakespeare's Macbeth. Middling? We don't really need to get into the whole thing. Yeah. Um, But in the play, Macbeth is the main character. Yes. He becomes the Thane of Cawdor. Yes. In the play. He kills King Duncan of Scotland, who's his close friend Mm -hmm. and all of that, so that he can become king himself. Wait. Is that why it's called Macbeth? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, In the play, I seem to remember that he murders Duncan in Inverness. But a lot of people associate the murder with Cawdor Castle. Mm. So I think the two have become muddied Muddied. because he's the Thane of Cawdor. Yeah. Macbeth is a great play. Lots mm-hmm. of murdering and witches and madness. I would highly recommend going to see it if you can. Yep. And Cawdor Castle has the open air theatre and quite often in the summer they're showing Macbeth yes. at Cawdor Castle and, and I, I'm dying to go. But it seems like Shakespeare took some creative liberties with history. Don't let history get in the way of a good narrative. Exactly. The real Macbeth was a real person and worthy of his own episode so I can't get completely into it here. He was King of Scotland. I think he was quite a good king. Between 1040 and 1057. Mm. Um, As far as I know, he was fine, but we won't get into it. Uh, But he was never Thane of Cawdor. And he did kill King Duncan of Scotland. Oh, yeah. But it was near Elgin, not in Inverness or Cawdor. Ah, still the same area. Yes. Closer than I thought it would be, but anyway. But there really really isn't a connection with Cawdor Castle. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't built until the 1300s. That makes sense. The real Macbeth was around far earlier. Yeah. Because Shakespeare didn't write it until the 1600s. He was 1600s, wasn't he? So they never stayed in the castle. 
it didn't happen the way it happens in the play. Lady Macbeth was never there. But it's a great story. Mm -hmm. And it was the sixth Earl, the one who died in 93, who said, I wish the bard had never written his damned play. (laughs) Yeah, it must have, in more recent years, just brought a bit of ridicule. That or just people going, oh, it's the Macbeth castle. No, it's not. (laughs) Yeah. No, it isn't. So that's the connection, but it's not based in fact. It's just taken from Shakespeare's play and his retelling of the story. So that's why, or part of the reason why the name was changed to Codder, like it had been written in Macbeth, Mm -hmm. to sort of tie it in with that legacy, I think. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. But I have more legends for you. Ooh, I mentioned one earlier. You did, you did, and we're about to talk about that just now. Excellent. There's a really special story associated with how Codder Castle was built, and it involves a special feature of the castle I haven't told you about yet. Now, if you know anything about Codder, you might have heard about the holly tree, or the hawthorn tree, depending on which story you've heard. But I'm going to tell you about it now. Please do. When you visit the castle, it's near the end of the tour route. Mm -hmm. You go down into a dungeon room of the castle. But what's surprising about this room is that in the very middle, there's a holly tree standing in the middle of it, underneath the castle. Yep. Before the current Calder Castle was built, the Calder family were living somewhere else. The legend goes that when the time came out, when the time came to pick out a site for the new castle, Codder Castle, the Thane at the time, the third Thane, in the 1300s, had a dream about how to choose where his new home should be built. He was given instructions in this dream on how to pick the spot, and he followed these instructions to the letter. He loaded up a donkey with a huge pile of gold. Massive. And he just released it from the grounds of his home, letting it roam wild and freely. He didn't influence it at all, he just let it do its own thing. And by the time the evening came, the donkey was knackered, because it had been walking around all day with a massive pile of Mm -hmm. gold on its back. The donkey lay down under a tree to recover and rest, and this was where the thane decided to build his castle. Mm. On the site of this tree. And according to the legend, this is the same tree that lies underneath the castle now. The tree is there. It's, it's very old. Yes. Very dead. I like that story. Here's why I don't think it's true. Oh, tell me. Because that is the same story of how Rome was founded. Yeah, that sounds about right. Because it was, or, <laughs> or Athens. It was either Romulus or... Theseus, Theseus, I think, who got told to tie a bag of gold around the neck of a cow. And wherever the cow lay down, that's where he should plant his town. Mm. Plant his town? I think Makes sense. Found his town. So there you go. Interesting. So it's, it's kind of like a fable. Yeah. So I don't think that part is true. But the tree is there. The tree is real. It is a real tree. It is really there. And they've built the castle around this tree. Yes, it isn't flowering or anything. It's, no. It doesn't have leaves, it's dead. Yeah. And scientific testing done on the tree shows that it died in the 1300s. Mm. Probably because a stonking big castle was built on top of it. <laughs> and yeah. blocked out any light that it needed to survive. You have to assume so. But for a long time the tree was referred to as the thorn tree or the hawthorn tree. But testing showed that it's actually a holly tree. Mm. It's funny, isn't it? People didn't know that for a long time. And the trees thought to protect the castle from harm. Kind of like a good luck charm. Yeah. That the tree keeps the castle and its inhabitants safe. It's very unusual seeing the tree down there. I've I've never seen or heard of anything like it. No, because it's almost like fossilised or mummified. It's petrified, I think. Oh, petrified. There we go. That's how I saw it described. Yeah. But it's bizarre. It's weird. It's It's really weird. the floor and like into the roof Uh of the dungeon room. Strange. I really enjoyed seeing it. It's it's everything you would hope from an old castle dungeon because it's Absolutely. creepy and dark, and then you just have this this tree. Yeah, and then off that room, 
they found like an extra dungeon yes. that was totally sealed off that you could only get to through a trap door. A secret dungeon. Yeah. They only discovered it in 1979. Yeah. Super recent. Secret dungeon next to your actual dungeon that you can, you could only get to via a trap door. Yeah. In the guidebook talks about it a little bit. And it says, In October 1891, the room above was gutted by fire, a blaze that was started by a spark in a jackdaw's nest. Mm. When the damage was repaired, the trap was floored over and all knowledge of the existence of the dungeon faded and was lost. <laughs> so they, they forgot it was there. Yeah. It's mad. Isn't that crazy? That is mad. The story I told you earlier about Callum Begg, apparently he was in that dungeon. Yes. And when one of the Thanes locked up Kilrock's son, mm -hmm. that was the dungeon. Was also in that dungeon. Yes. I remember. Now, what I thought was weird... What do you I think? took I took a photo of the secret dungeon. I got up close and personal, camera in, mm -hmm. and I I should have posted it up on Instagram by this point, but they have mirrors in front of the little window you look through, so you can see what's like out of view. Yeah, because there's, there's the floor's all broken and stuff, and it's just yeah. a little like I don't know two foot square hole you can look through to see in. Yeah, you, you can't get in there. They've kept it sealed it's got a bit of perspex over it so you can just kind of peer in around that yes but they have mirrors set up so you can see yeah. it and I had a good peer I lent in got the camera in so I could get a clear photo and I heard tapping oh yeah you did from in there mm -hmm. and I told you at the time and you laughed in my face I did I directly did in my face but it was just like a little just a little, little tappy tap a little tappy tap and it gave me the ick because it kept going. It wasn't like a a stone falling. It was a very measured just tap. Consistent tap. Spooky. I thought it was spooky. Yeah. Spooked me out. But you laughed at me. I did. It's a gut reaction to spooky things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good one. It's not like actually. Oh. Ah. I feel like I heard it. It, it happened. Heard it with your own two eyes. Mm-hmm. But Codder Castle does not seem to have escaped having its fair share of ghosts. Ooh. There are a lot of like good wee corridors that are dark mm -hmm. and things. There's a lot of good opportunity for ghosts. Yeah, a lot of it's quite windy. Mm -hmm. Now, as you would kind of expect, there are stories that say Muriel Calder haunts the castle and has supposedly been seen. But there isn't much information about how she haunts or people who have seen her. Mm. Some people have reported seeing a woman in blue and they say that she's Muriel. But there's another ghostly woman who's been seen in the castle mm -hmm. who's been identified as Lady Caroline, who was the wife of the first Lord Codder. So remember I said in 1796 he was made a Lord. Yep. A this bit, is his wife. A bit more recently. Yes. The couple met when the Baron, who was referred to as Jack Campbell, he saw Caroline from the window, or like in the window, of the home that she had in London. Wow. And he demanded that his friends introduce him because he wanted to meet her. She, oh. He had to know who she was. Oh. And they met and probably fell in love, but they definitely got married. Yeah, hopefully but, fell in love. Yeah, but it, it seems like they genuinely were in love. They were very close. Well, and that's used nice. to go riding a lot together. I don't need to know about their personal business. <laughs> But she's been seen wearing a blue velvet dress. Ooh. So just like the accounts of people who've seen Muriel, uh -huh. they say she's wearing a blue velvet dress, but they've seen Caroline in the drawing room of the castle, which is the first room you enter on the tour. Yes. If you remember. I'll try and post photos on Instagram because I have a few photos from in there. And apparently she's gazing up at the portrait of her husband, that is hanging in there that we saw and I took some photos of that, that portrait without mm -hmm. really meaning to and there's one that I've taken of you looking into a mirror and Jack Campbell is pointing at you oh really yeah <laughs> kind of hang on I remember posing for said photo mm -hmm. I read about this legend I liked it did you mm -hmm. gazing up at the portrait I also thought we haven't had a blue lady no I don't think we have I think we've had all the other colour of rainbows of lady there's a lot of ladies at Stirling Castle. Yes. But we haven't had a blue lady yet. There you go. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> He's over there. Mm -hmm. And there's also a portrait of Caroline in that room. But I only just have her like in frame, I think. Mm. She's also behind you, which I think is quite funny that they're both looking at you. I'm being watched. So it's that, that one there. It's her. Okay, yeah. So her portrait is hanging in there too. Uh-huh. So I think it's like a velvet dress is very of the era. But can you imagine like a blue velour dress or something? With juicy on the bum. Yeah, or in the years from now, I'm like, oh yeah, they were seen wandering the halls in the shiny acrylic tracksuit they <laughs> used to wear. A checkered shirt and yeah. skinny jeans. <laughs> That's it there. That's a bear. Oh yeah, there she That's is. That's her portrait. Now, what I found interesting... And you're going to like sigh and laugh at me again, so I'm okay. preparing for that. But I'm going to share it anyway, because some people want to know. We walked into the drawing room, starting the tour, and I think it's my favourite room in the whole place. Like I said to you at the time, it's so warm and welcoming. I don't know if it's the lighting in there, or the fact that the walls are this kind of orangey colour, but it just feels really nice in there. I didn't really want to leave, but then you turned around and you pointed out the balcony. Yeah, there's a, a spooky wee balcony up above the door you come in. Like behind us. And it's known as the Minstrels Gallery. Oh, nice. I thought you'd like that. And it's not massive. It just it goes from one side of the room to the other. And there's a door at either end. But I didn't like having my back to that balcony. Did you not? I didn't like it. Oh, that's interesting. I really loved the room. I loved being there. I didn't like turning away from that balcony. Mm. It really put me on edge and I just felt like I was being watched and I kept wanting to turn around to look at it. And that was actually why I took, I just showed Kieran, uh, the photo that I did because I just felt weird. It's a funny little like indoor balcony because it's yeah. just a little walkway between two rooms that looks really short. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to have a photo of it for reasons... But check. it just, it made me feel really strange. I didn't like turning away from it. To check for ghosts. I don't know if it's because it's higher up. So just thinking about someone looking down on you and having that advantage is kind of unsettling. Yeah. I'm really not sure. But I thought I would say it. It, it was a funny, a funny little balcony. Mm -hmm. Caroline's husband, Lord Jack, has also been seen wandering the castle. Has he indeed? Mm -hmm. Although he didn't die there. By all accounts, he died at their home in Bath. Bath. I yes. uh, see that raises the question of like what your ghost logic is again. Like, it's the rules. You talked about that last time. Like, what are the rules of ghosts? Yeah, because they can't. How does it work? Or can they just do whatever in, in the ghost universe? Because I think you'd have to stay where you were. I don't think so. I think you would have some choice. You think? If it was somewhere that meant a lot to you, I think you could choose to mm. be there. Who'd you ask? <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Maybe if you were particularly tormented somewhere, you wouldn't have the choice and you would be stuck there. Maybe. Because of the, the torment and uh -huh. the, the level of pain. But if it's somewhere that meant a lot to you and it was nice, I think you could choose to be there. That's fair. That's a nicer way to think about it. It's what I've always thought. Wander your ancestral home. Yeah, I think. I like that. I like that. But I've saved the best ghost story for last. Have you? Yes. If you're still here, congratulations. You get the good bit. Yep. That's your reward. This ghost story has gotten a little muddled over time because some people attribute it to Codder Castle. Mm -hmm. uh, there's stories that say it happens there, but that doesn't seem to be the case. The historical event that took place didn't happen in Cotter. Oh, okay. It happened at a different castle, very close to Cotter, called Rate Castle. I wondered if we were getting to this. <laughs> Kieran and I visited Rate Castle. It's only a couple of miles from Cotter. It's very uh -huh. close. We took a field trip there. We did, because we're nicely between the two. Mm -hmm. And this is where this haunting is supposedly taking place. Ooh. So... In the 1400s, Rate Castle was owned by the Cummings, who were also called the De Rates, uh, or the Comans, lots of different names. I'm going to f refer to them as the De Rates. In the early 1400s, the third Thane of Codder, who's the one who had the castle built, uh -huh. 
was murdered by Alexander de Reit. Oh my days! Who owned Reit Castle? He murdered him in cold blood. So Alexander de Reit had to flee south, so that he wouldn't face the consequences for murdering him. Oh man, that's intense. Mm-hmm. Bad blood between the two families. Ooh, they are quite close together. Mm-hmm. In 1442, Rate Castle was set to pass from the Durate family to the Macintoshes. Okay. And the Durates and the Macintoshes didn't like each other. They fought on opposite sides during the War of Independence a hundred years earlier. Mm-hmm. The Durates had supported Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, while the Macintoshes had supported Robert the Bruce. Oh, uh, okay. But th- okay. this was a hundred years before, but yeah. that's kind of enough to set them at odds with each other. Now, in and around 1442, the de Reits had to hand over Rake Castle. Okay. Which they were not happy about. Because the guy had fl- fled. I don't really know. It's confusing. Okay. I don't know whether they were ordered to do this. Uh-huh. Because um, they were having their, their castle taken away. It was forfeited. I'm not sure. So I didn't want to say anything. Okay, that's fair. I respect that. I just know that this had to happen. And the de Reits proposed a big feast to be held at Rake Castle in honour of the Macintoshes and to try and put to bed their feuding with each other and leave the past behind them. I sure hope it's not a trap. Well, what the Macintoshes didn't know is that this wasn't the true motive of the Durates oh. at all. Oh, no. They planned to murder the Macintoshes. Aha, we can't give them the castle if they're all dead. Mm-hmm. Is that that a good plan? What could go wrong? Flawless. The Durates planned to attend the feast, all secretly armed. And when the time came, they would put the Macintoshes to slaughter. Classic. Yep. Under under their own roof. I know. But what they didn't count on was a besotted young couple. Oh, lovely. The Durate Laird's daughter had fallen in love with one of the Macintoshes. Uh-oh. And when she learned of the scheme proposed by her, fa- her father, she had to warn him so that he wouldn't be killed. This tipped off the Macintoshes as to what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But they didn't cancel the feast. They went just as planned, but armed with dirks hidden in their clothes. Yep, they just so, came even more armed. Well, they weren't going to be armed before. Yes, uh, more armed than the other ones. Oh, they're bringing weapons? We'll bring even more weapons. Oh, right. Well, dirks, if you don't know, they're like short, or very long daggers, but a very short, pointy sword. Yeah. So you can hide one in your clothes, potentially. The Macintoshes pretended to be completely ignorant of the threat, pretended they didn't know anything. The two families are all sitting in the dining hall, and the Laird of Durate proposes a toast to the dead, an end to their feud, once and for all. But instead of raising their glasses, the Durates raised their swords. Oh no. But then to their horror, the Macintoshes withdrew weapons of their own, and there was a slaughter. I can't see this going well for anybody involved. No. The Durates definitely came off worse. They suffered more casualties than the Macintoshes did. They were defeated, basically. Oh, uh-huh. And it didn't take the Laird long to discover how the Macintoshes had known about the plot. Uh Uh-oh. He blamed his daughter and he knew what she had done. She wasn't able to plead her innocence or hide from him. He was out for blood. So she ran and ran as fast as she could. But her father chased her through the corridors of Rake Castle, bellowing and screaming at her in fury. She made it to one of the towers of the castle and knew that the only option she had that might save her was to climb out of the window and to safety. Oh no. But when her father caught up with her as she was climbing out the window, he chopped off her hands. Oh! That's one to step further than I expected. I think he was going to push her, but that's so much worse. Mm-hmm. Chopping off her hands so she falls. Yep. And oh. he just let her fall to her death wow in revenge for her betrayal totally chill casual so it's now reported on multiple occasions that a lonely woman haunts Rake Castle a woman with no hands oh oh, oh, oh. that's so much worse 
Now, I came across a different version of this haunting, which suggested that all of this happened in the 1880s, and it was the Earl of Cawdor who chased down his daughter and killed her in this fashion. But there doesn't seem to be any basis for that. So I think it's gotten muddled somewhere. Yeah. Because there is historical basis for the dinner at Rake Castle. Oh, yeah. That is something that really happened. But the reason that I bring it up in this episode, even though it doesn't seem all that related, uh-huh. is that Rake Castle is now owned by the Cotter family. Oh, yeah. It's part of their property, and it has been since 1532. Wow. So I don't know. I read in some things that when... Alexander de Ray murdered the Thane. He forfeited his property, and that's when the Codders took Rake Castle. That would make sense. But it wouldn't explain why the de Rates had to give it to the Macintoshes then. Yeah. If they didn't own it in the first place. So I'm not sure. That's confusing to me too. Maybe, just conjecture, you can't know, but the Thane of Codder, the Thane of Codder died... So they got the castle, the family, as compensation, mm-hmm. and then they like leased it. That's what I wondered to the family. But then the lease was running out, and the next ones were taking up the lease instead. Maybe, maybe it seems to be something of that nature. I, I couldn't really tell. No, I shouldn't so, really guess, but yeah, I just I didn't want to make it up, so yeah. to speak. Well, but they can... they own Rake Castle now. And the castle was completely abandoned mm. not long after the massacre took place. It was left to ruin, and now it's believed to be haunted by a girl with no hands. Well, I can see why you didn't want to go there at night time. I suggested we do that before we re- the day before we re- record. Nope. <laughs> not doing that. No, thank you. Well, I thought it was very peaceful at well, the castle. You, even, you had to encourage me to go into one of the like surviving... Tower rooms. I didn't want to go in there. Yeah, it's a ruin, but it's a, a very well kept ruin. It is. Um, Cotter, the people at Cotter have said that they're not interested in making it into a tourist attraction, but they want to maintain it in its current state. Yeah. As the ruin and maintain the wildlife and the plant growth around it. Yeah, because there's like the grass is cut around the outside and then all the stonework, not all the stonework, a lot of the stonework is still in very good yes. condition. There's a group or like society type thing called Friends of Rake Castle. Oh, yeah. And they think if more of the growth gets cut back, it's going to reveal things like where the castle chapel was. Interesting. They seem to have an idea of where it is and mm. think they could find it if they can cut back all the growth. Wow, it is very overgrown. It's really like, like brambles and thick, yeah. thick growth. But maintained. Yeah, outside of this grass cut area around outside mm-hmm. that's super interesting mm-hmm. so i know it's not directly related to cotter uh-huh. but it is a bit i i think it's close enough and it's a good story yeah because that would scare me shitless oh i know a no-handed ghost mm-hmm. creepy Just bloody stumps very creepy well or maybe like half a hand Ooh, just a thumb that'd be worse <laughs> <laughs> but that is the mammoth story of Cotter Castle. That's a good one. Maybe if the ghost just had thumbs, you wouldn't be scared because she gave you a thumbs up. <laughs> More thumbs down. Hold oh, on. No. <laughs> Dress like Caesar. <laughs> oh no! This is why we can't go at night because we'd be killed. Because you'd say something like that, we'd get going, and then she would kill us. I'd get carried up and then thrown off the top. For just being so disrespectful. Disrespectful, <laughs> disrespectful yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Well, that was a journey. Yeah. I enjoyed that immensely. A good journey? I, I thought it was a good journey. Lots of interesting bits. A tasty little supper. And a it, nice pood at the end. <laughs> <laughs> it has a really interesting history. Yeah, I think so. And I love that I can talk about the history that happened in my back garden. Yeah, I, I like that as well. It makes it more alive for me. Mm-hmm. And when you can see it for yourself, it's very special. Yes, I think so. Can I recommend going to Cotter? It's a good day. Yes. It's not part of the National Trust. No, but... no, it's not. It's still privately owned. Yeah. But... They close over winter time. I think they close in October through to April. April, yeah, I think. So it's just the sort of spring and summer. Yeah. But if you're interested, you should look it up because it was a great day. It's funny how because we've done quite a few castles now, but they're always different. Yeah. 
like you would think a 700 year old history of a castle full of toffs and such would be quite consistent across all the different castles but it never is well i think because all the consistencies i don't share that's true eh? because like you could look these things up with the political careers and what they did and Hmm, this lord was a politician, followed up by his son, who was a politician, yeah, you know, followed by his son, who was a politician. <laughs> that kind of thing I don't include. Not because it's not important, but it's just... It's just nothing. It's what you would expect, and it's a bit dull. Yeah, that's fair. I just tell you the good bits. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I like hearing the good bits. Thank you so much for listening, if you've made it this far. Thank you. That was a goodie. <laughs> that was a doozy of an episode. And we will be back next week. Yes. Now we're off to do the blether for Patreon. Yes. So come join us. Please do. It's great fun. Mm -hmm. The wee blethers go up on a Monday. So something to look forward to. (laughs) After the weekend. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. We have some very exciting news. We've partnered with the National Trust for Scotland. Joining the Trust with one of their memberships helps to preserve and protect the many amazing, historical and significant sites across Scotland for future generations. Your membership gets you free access to all 500 National Trust locations across the country, as well as free parking. And who doesn't love free parking? A National Trust for Scotland membership is ideal for days out with the family or for saving money on that tour across Scotland that you're taking for your holidays to see all the generally spooky sites like Culloden Battlefield, Culloden Castle and Glencoe National Nature Reserve. Use the link in our description to get your Trust membership and you'll be preserving Scotland's history as well as supporting us here at the podcast. Thank you and happy travels! I have a very important question to ask you. Have you checked out the Generally Spooky Patreon yet? Because if not, why not? We've got oodles of content over there, exclusive episodes only available on Patreon, our wee blethers, the chatty, unscripted weekly show where Kieran and I discuss episodes, what's going on with us, and generally have a great time. There's also the Spooky Book Club, where you'll get a chapter a week of a spooky classic. At the moment, we're in the middle of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, and I am dying to know how it ends. As well as all that goodness, joining our Patreon is really what keeps the podcast going. It allows us to keep doing what we love, which is chatting to all of you about spooky Scottish history. Your £75 a month... No, I'm just kidding. You can pay 4 8 or £12 a month to keep the lights on and keep the creepy cogs turning. So come join in. Search Generally Spooky Patreon or click on the link in our description. We recently partnered with The Spark Company here at the podcast, who are a clothing brand who know what's up. They're a community for anyone who believes in the radical notion that everyone should be treated equally. And we can definitely get behind that here at Generally Spooky HQ. And we know that you will too, since our listeners are the best. We've treated ourselves to some excellent pieces Kieran is already jealous of my Fight Like a Girl sweatshirt, but he isn't getting it. And if you use our link to treat yourself to something just as awesome, it's yet another way to support us here on the podcast. The quality is great, the message is great, and if you use the discount code SPOOKYSPARK5 and the link below, you'll get 5% off your first order. Thank you so much, Spark Company. You guys are awesome. And thank you so much for supporting our rambling.